It is Thursday afternoon, East Lansing, Michigan. Come on in, gather around, gather around, gather around. My name is Jim Comproni, publisher, SpartanMag.com. Going to talk some Michigan State basketball a couple days late on this. Those of you that are SpartanMag.com subscribers, uh, you know that I was out of town for a couple days. I was not at the Michigan State-Ohio State game. So right now is the first time I'm going to be commenting about it. I was on the Tim Stout show locally in Lansing a moment ago, talked about it there. But uh, also going to have Paul Connerdyke calling in shortly. Hopefully everything works out audio-wise and we'll, we will get his thoughts. We didn't have a, a post-game V-cast after the game on Sunday. We'll talk about it now. I actually reviewed the game last night again, took a close look at it, have some comments about it and the season, the direction of the season. Also, we will talk about um, some of the big controversies, a lot of people talking about playing time and allocation of playing time. Um that's an interesting thing as Michigan State continues to develop its young players. We will get into that later. Uh, and if you're not familiar with this, my name is Jim Comproni, publisher, SpartanMag.com. SpartanMag.com, the Michigan State website for the On3 Network. Go over there, check it out. You will like it if you're watching this podcast and you're interested in Michigan State sports. Here at the podcast, um, we take questions. And I just announced just about two hours ago that we would we would be having this podcast it's we don't have really a regularly scheduled time been working toward that end <clears throat> in the past i've never really nailed down a set day and time just went out there two hours ago and said hey podcast today one o'clock post some questions we got about six or seven questions we will go over those also expecting Conan Dyke to, t- to call in in a few minutes we will talk basketball with him i've not had a chance to talk with him about the ohio state game even though it was four days ago it is the biggest game of the year thus far because of the loss and what the loss means for Michigan State and what what the what that does for the table for the remainder of, of the season. Um, so in the meantime, give us a like to the channel. We really appreciate that. And also your comments and your uh, if you like the channel, that helps a lot with the algorithms and it helps us get this podcast in front of the eyeballs of other Michigan State fans on YouTube that do Michigan State searches. This will come into their uh, on their table if we get a lot of that type of action. We appreciate that. So subscribe to the channel. Give us a like. That really helps a lot. And go over to SpartanMag.com. One dollar can become a subscriber. Check it out as we head towards spring football practice. Have some coverage of that coming up real soon. All right, let's go right to the mailbag before uh, Paul calls. Got a question from Troy in Nashville, Michigan. Nashville, Michigan. He says, uh, what do you see as the biggest possible weakness on the football team this fall? It's a football question. I've been scrambling around trying to get some information basketball-wise, doing some analysis and and double-checking some things. Football question kind of came out of, uh, we appreciate those football questions, especially going into spring practice, and we will learn more about this team heading into spring and whatever the spring scrimmage looks like April 20th. And we will continue to get feedback from the Michigan State football coaches. But, you know, I this is a question I've not thought about. And a lot of times I'll have a, a, a an answer right away to any questions that come up. Sometimes I have to do some thinking. On this one, I had to do some thinking. I actually pulled out what I expect to be the depth chart this spring. And I'm going position by position, Michigan State football. And as strange as this sounds for a team that's 4-8 and eight with all the turnover that they've had, nine transfers coming in. I think it's nine with some still to come and some still in limbo a little bit uh what was it about you know 13 or 14 went to the portal and about nine or so graduating seniors one guy had eligibility eligibility remaining and went to the nfl to try his luck at the nfl that being jacoby winman so i think 27 players out 27 players in 19 high school freshmen coming in and about, you know, eight or nine transfers. So position by position, you know, for a team that was four and eight with a lot of turnover, I can't really look at one position that is like a a jarring, huge weakness. I'm sure some weaknesses will come up, but across the board, I mean, you go position by position. Quarterback Aiden Childs, not much experience. A lot of talent. Sophomore, not sure what we're going to see there. It might be good. Depends on what he has around him. Running back, you have Nathan Carter coming back. Jalen Berger has to toe the line, show he's capable. uh, Jaron Mangum has to show that he's healthy, but running back, I don't think is a weakness. Nathan Carter, pretty good running back, and those other two are going to push him, assuming Jalen Berger does everything right and he's around and everything, uh, which I, I don't see any reason why that won't be the case at this point. With a couple of true freshmen coming in that could help. Tight end, Jack Velling coming in. He's good. I mean, he was the best tight end of the Pac-12 last year. Parachek, 
sophomore, I think, has a chance to develop. At wide receiver, it might be, you know, wide receiver's always been a position of strength at Michigan State. But they're kind of lacking the big type wide receiver. The, the weakness might be wide receiver, as rare as that is for a Michigan State team. You've got Jerron Glover brought him back from the portal, which is good. Antonio Gates. I've heard some decent things about Antonio Gates, like leadership-wise in the offseason. That might be someone who might take it to the next level in terms of his affinity for football, which is a big deal for him. He has ability. Unproven still, but in terms of proven players, Jerron Glover about four starts last year as a first-year player for the most part. Montori Foster, functional player. They were expecting to get T.J. Sheffield coming in for Purdue. That would have helped a lot. Would not be surprised if Michigan State went back into the portal for a wide receiver after spring practice. So wide receiver is a little bit thin. And by Michigan State standards, it's quite thin in terms of proven players and breakout players. There's no Keon Coleman, Jaden Reed in this bunch. And as everybody knows, as a Michigan State fan that watches this, Michigan State has put out wide receivers exceptionally well for the last 30 years. Wide receiver, believe it or not, might be the weakness. Let's see if this will work with Paul. As some of you know, we've had a little trouble with audio the last couple of weeks. Let's hope this works. Call from Paul Conendike. To accept, press 1. To send a voicemail, press 2. All right, we're bringing in associate editor extraordinaire of SpartanMag.com for a long time, and a good friend of mine and a great worker and a great professional, a great journalist, and a lot of fun to be around. Paul Konerdijk's checking in from somewhere in West Michigan. Paul, thanks thanks for joining the show. Welcome to the show. How are you doing, Paul? I, I really want you to say something from Parts Unknown. Parts Unknown, yeah. We, you know, some of yeah, our... Yeah, I like that. You know, some of our... Uh, you know, when we do the mailbag portion of the, of the show, we encourage people to post where they are posting from. And if they don't, I will say they're from Parts Unknown. But increasingly, lately, if they don't say where they're from, I just assign a, a town to them, like Elk Rapids or something like that, which I know it's a town you're oh, fond of. Oh. So... Yeah, Elk Rapids is great, but uh, you're not Ernie Harwell, so... Well, I know. That's... Yeah, that, but I, I just want people to say where they're from. But I've used Parts Unknown. Someday we will bring in Paul from Parts Unknown, and he will be broadcasting on video with a mask on, and that'll be a lot of fun. But Paul did a great job covering Michigan State all week. Uh, those of you that are SpartanMag.com subscribers might know that I was I was uh, out of town for a few days. Paul did a great job covering the Ohio State game and the aftermath, including yesterday's practice video of, Paul, of uh, Tom Izzo courtside after practice got a little tense a little heated that was certainly interesting Paul doing a great job Jake Lascow a great job Jason uh, Killip great job Noah Sprunger's done a great job over the years appreciate all of those guys and uh, I gotta I gotta say uh, you know full disclosure um, you know so my son was home for spring break we hadn't seen him in weeks so we just kind of planned a little little long weekend excursion and when we looked at the schedule, okay, you know, spring break coincides with a, with a break in Michigan State's basketball schedule. They only play one game during that time. They have a few days off. They play Ohio State and a few days off. That'd be a great time to get away. The Ohio State game, there's not going to be any drama in that game. They're playing at home. Ohio State fired their coach. Wheels are coming off. Uh, that should be an easy win. Well, th- in terms of this team and college basketball in general, you cannot assume anything. And, of course, Michigan State goes off, loses that game. Paul did a great job with his coverage, and including yesterday after practice. And we've got that video of Izzo after practice practice here at the SpartanMag.com YouTube channel. Paul, your thoughts on what Izzo said after practice yesterday or just any topic you might want to tackle? Because you and I have not talked about the Ohio State game or this team since it went down. I appreciate you being here. But your thoughts watching practice yesterday, Izzo's comments, or anything Michigan State basketball-wise uh, leading off in your mind? What's going on? What do you think? Well, I'm probably going to be wide-ranging and random. The first thing I'd like to say is I wish every Michigan State fan out there that's down on players on this roster. I wish they could see a practice and see what guys do in practice because what they do in practice doesn't always translate to games. Mm-hmm. You know, people make assumptions on what guys can and can't do and how good or bad they are based on what they see. And, uh, and I think Izzo has a right to be salty. I mean, he's been upfront with everybody about Xavier Booker in the process mm-hmm. and where he was coming into the program, what he needed to do to get to a point where he could – reach of a, uh, a minimum of playing functional basketball. We're not talking about a guy coming in and playing like a Jaron Jackson or a Deonta Davis or, you know, Brandon Dawson or whom, whomever played it as a, as a true freshman. And there's been quite a lot of the, those guys over the years. We're talking about functional basketball. So to try to compare Xavier Booker to a guy like Draymond Green as a freshman or Xavier Tillman as a freshman, those two guys had very good basketball IQ and, 
they had some things that they could do that Xavier Booker can't do. The number one fault that I would have with Xavier Booker, and I think he's made a ton of progress. I want to say that straight up, and I think he's going to be a good player. He's going to be far better than I expected him to be based on the progress he's made thus far. The number one thing Michigan State needs, in my opinion, is rebounding. It's It's been a big problem, and the number one thing he can't provide is rebounding. And uh, so everybody out there that thinks – the unseen is undefeated because when he left the game, Michigan State was up by a certain amount. And people assume, well, if he had stayed in the game, that they would have won the game. I'm not I'm not buying that because Ohio State was putting him in ball screens and he has a really hard time with that. Like a lot of young guys, um, over over the years. But people assume that that Ohio State's not gonna make adjustments based on the personnel that, that is on the floor. Um, Booker did a good job, I think, in that game. But Xavier Booker, I agree with Thomas 100%. Xavier Booker and Monty Sissoko were not the reasons why Michigan State lost that game to Ohio State. And if you want to look at like one of the, the things that it's a real problem for Michigan State right now, it's the health of Tyson Walker. Mm-hmm. Um, his inability to create for himself like he was able to create uh, early in the season pre-groin injury, not just the stuff at the rim, the layups and whatnot. I'm talking about the quick release the the feeling good about his jumper from the perimeter. He is not what he was earlier in the season. He's not the guy that scored 30 points against Purdue mm-hmm. last year at Breslin Center. He's a guy that's trying to get through the season, trying to be a two-way player, but is physically not able to do it. Mm-hmm. Jaden Akins is a streak, streaky shooter. Um, they needed Tyson Walker to make shots in that game. They needed Jaden Akins to make do better than going one for nine. I think a- Aikens did some good things in the game as a rebounder, kind of, you know, scrapping around doing some, some hustle things that he needs to do. But Ohio state was going to make it ugly, just like they did in the big 10 tournament. And the fact that Xavier Booker wasn't on the floor, that has nothing to do with Michigan state, not shooting a high percentage in that game. Mm-hmm. He wasn't on the floor last year for Michigan state. They had Joey Hauser and they still shot 30%, 20% from three point range against those guys in the big 10 tournament. Great points. I agree with all of that. I know you probably have a lot of other thoughts. And, you know, Booker is the thing that I've been hearing about a lot. And, you know, people wondering why he didn't play more. I mean, that's that's going to be um, a popular opinion because he gets his first start, plays pretty well, did some good things. Going back over it, um, Sissoko, I thought, you know, when you, when you get into the last eight minutes of the game, um, Sissoko and Hall played the rest of the way for the last 742 Michigan State was up six when they checked in. Sissoko, for those 742, got on the court and stayed on the court. And I thought Sissoko played the best he has played since before the road Minnesota game when they lost at Minnesota after his grandmother died. Basically, I think that's the best he's played since his grandmother passed away in terms of playing his role, defense, rebounding. Um, no, you're not going to get thrown down into the post and get you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar production out of him in the post. With him in the game, you need offense from the other four players, obviously. And Michigan State ran some decent stuff. Tyson Walker missed some shots, like you said. Ran some other things that were new wrinkles that did not go well. And after Paul's gone, we'll go over some of those things. But Sissoko's on there to provide glue, to be a glue player. You're not going to go to him. And if Booker were on the court, you're not going to go to him either. You're going to go to the other four guys. Now, he might accumulate points... Um, here and there, coming open for a three-pointer like he did earlier in the game, maybe a garbage situation. But the chances of him uh, having a defensive lapse late in the game when it's close with six minutes to go are greater with with Booker out there than Sissoko out there. Sissoko is better on defense. Meanwhile, you can say, well, but Booker can give you something on offense. That's not the way basketball works. You you go if you if you have five guys that can all score, that's great, and you're you're one of the top five teams in the country. If you have five guys that can all shoot and score, maybe top two in the country. But with what Michigan State has and where Booker is and his level of of um, development, with that game being tight and becoming tighter, um. Some people might not want to look at it this way, but if you're going to lose that game, you don't want to lose that game with Booker on the court. Some people might say, well, that's that's loser speak. You, you put him out there, you might have won, and the unknown's undefeated and all those things. Uh, I, I thought that there were some some situations where Booker maybe could have gotten in, in around the 10-minute mark, and we'll get into that later. That might have been a time when he could get a couple minutes, and maybe if he'd have played well there, maybe he earned some time late. But it became a very tight situation, nut-cutting time as as 
Judd Heathcote used to say. They went with Sissoko. He played the last seven minutes, and he was solid. Got a big offensive rebound with 38 seconds left. And in that situation, tries to go back up and score, got stripped. And that was, a, that was a key juncture of the game. In that situation, if he goes back up, gets fouled as he makes free throws. If he goes back up, or if he gets an offensive rebound, you know, you're programmed to go back up strong. That's what these young men are programmed to do. They were up by one, I think, at that point. That offensive rebound, I'm wondering, Paul, if you get that offensive rebound and bring it back outside to reset with a one-point lead and 38 seconds to go, how does the game go from there? But the bottom line is he got an offensive rebound, but then he was stripped of it. But Sissoko, I thought, was, was solid glue. Sissoko, not great. Not a plus, necessarily, but got back to doing more of what he was before his grandmother died. And I was worried about him and whether they were kind of losing him a little bit for a lot of reasons. Um, He was motivated, did okay, but like you said, it was the guards who didn't produce. And that's what Izzo said after practice yesterday. Everybody's talking about Booker. And I, I, to me, it's... It's usually, I mean, coaches make big decisions on who goes in the game and who doesn't, and that has an impact on things, obviously, and they, they put a lot of time into that. I also look into X's and O's and who's, who, what plays are they running and how does it produce and those type of things. Um, I think in a lot of areas, it's easy to look as to who's on the court and who's off the court, and for a lot of fans, and it's their prerogative, they buy tickets and they, they support the team and they put time into it. A lot of times, who's on the court is 98% of their analysis of what's going right and wrong in this situation you've got booker who's been playing well lately and that's become a lightning rod of attention and i think too much attention in terms of what went wrong in that game i agree with what you said and what with it what Izzo said it was guard breakdowns really from about the 10 moment 10 minute mark on with trey holloman making a pair of tough decisions during a key five minute stretch that i thought was pivotal in the game uh, your thoughts a little bit more about what Izzo said before I maybe get into some of those things and yesterday and what you saw in practice. You can't really talk a lot. You know, they don't want us to give specifics, but some generalities are always interesting yeah. in practice. Just the mood of the team and the mood of Tom Izzo. I will say this, Paul, the post-game press conference that you shot, uh, the video here at SpartanMag.com YouTube channel, <clears throat> Izzo... Um, you know, sometimes when they lose, he's angry and he wants to get back to brass tacks. And, you know, that practice, the next practice, or we're going to get after it. Usually you get that Izzo. The Izzo we're getting now is a more like, uh, you know, he said it was the most difficult loss he's had in eight or 10 years. I'd probably imagine similar to maybe some of those Wisconsin losses to Bo Ryan when that rivalry was going. Um, Izzo is kind of at a loss. I've said for weeks, this team is like herding cats and you, it's impossible to herd cats. And this, this game was a, an example of that. Meanwhile, Michigan State was still experimenting developmentally with the starting lineup and experimenting, experimenting with some player lineups, including the Cooper and Kohler lineup playing together for five minutes during in a very pivotal stretch, pivotal stretch midway through the second half. So it's still a team under construction late in the year. They don't have many losses. They're running out of chips. So all of those things are scattered and you're hurting cats. And Tyson Walker is not the 30-point scorer, like you said. That's a great way to put it. And all those things, and Izzo, his mood after the game, the Ohio State game, crushed. I don't want to say totally lost confidence, but more of like at a loss than I've seen him maybe in a post-game press conference. Your thoughts about what he looked like after the game and said and what he said in practice yesterday and, and his behavior, or do you, am I looking into that too much? Just your thoughts on that whole, that that branch of what's going on with Michigan State right now. Yeah, I think you are looking at it too much because Izzo is in nature reactionary. He's more reactionary than his players, and he has been for a long time. So he does take, take it on the chin. He said similar stuff after the minute, after the Minnesota game. You know, after other, other games, he's been – He's been in a, in, a, in a pretty dark spot. You know, he doesn't like to lose, and I, under, I understand that. I, I want to go back. Just I just want to go back to one of the things that allowed Michigan State to build that ten point lead against Ohio State in the first half. It was not what they did in the half court. Their half court offense, frankly, was garbage for most of the game. Um, it was what, what they did was they made hustle plays. They got deflections. They they ran down loose balls. They played some decent defense at the end of that first half, and they're able to turn a a, a crappy game a crappy offensive performance into a, a 10 point, a 10 point game. Um, you know, when I think when Xavier Booker, when he came out of the game for his first shift, 
when he was done with that first shift. I think maybe he was at the 12-minute mark. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was even later than that. Michigan State had only scored 12 points, 12 or 13 points. So this whole revisionist history about what he can do as far as stretching the floor and it totally changes the complexion of the game, in my opinion, is horse crap. You're not, people aren't looking at, at how basketball is played, especially when you consider about the importance of, of ball screen coverage. And that's, that's like the number one thing uh, that dictates whether a big can have success at Michigan State and, and can't. And I, I go back o- over the years. The guys that have been successful are guys that can cover ball screens. I think he's going to get there mm-hmm. maybe earlier than I thought he was going to get. Yeah, me too. But to say, to say that this is, this is why a Hall of Fame coach – did not win win this game. You want you don't want to see him out there against a team like Iowa. You don't want to see him out there. Well, he's going to be out there against against Purdue, and uh, and he's going to have to be because Michigan State's going to use twenty five fouls in that game, mm-hmm. just like Northwestern did. But I mean, to to think that to think that the five man is the reason why Michigan State State is struggling. The five man hasn't changed all season long. Michigan State was is at its best when guards are making making plays. That's when Tyson Walker can hit shots. A.J. Hogarth setting the table for for, get, for guards. When Jaden Aikens isn't going one for nine. I mean, that that to me is like, right. you want to look at, at Captain Obvious. Jaden Aikens, if he's going one for nine, Michigan State's not, not doing well unless unless a like guy like Trey Holliman's coming off the bench and picking up the slack. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I thought – from practice, the other one thing I will say is I don't think I saw Jaden Aikens or Trey Holloman miss a shot in practice yesterday. Now that doesn't mean it's going to translate into, into the games, but um, you know, I, Ohio State does some does some some things that I, I think are tricky. And I think one of the things that hurts, and I wrote this after after the game, and I know it sounds stupid, but one of the things that Ohio State does a good job of is they. The teams that play the best against Ohio State have guards that have zero conscience. And Ohio State does a nice job of putting enough enough of a man on a three point shooter, getting out there far enough to make it look like guys are um, are reasonably covered. And uh, and and they do a nice job of it. Teams like a Penn State uh, or or an Illinois that have guys that that don't think twice about letting it fly, regardless of who's covering them, they tend to do a little bit better against an Ohio State. Uh, but the inability to hit perimeter jumpers against mm-hmm. the team in Ohio State it's got quality rim protection inside. Uh, Tyson Walker wasn't wasn't get Tyson Walker, AJ Hogard, Jaden Akins weren't getting those shots at the rim. They've got rim protection. They do a nice job with their shot blocking. If you're not pulling up and hitting those jumpers from 15 feet, or maybe the jump stop in the lane, you're not going to get those easy buckets at, at the rim. And I think. Uh, between that and then making Michigan State hesitate on some of their on some of their three balls, I think you know that plays right into um, Ohio State's hands. I'll go back to the Big Ten tournament last year that that I covered. Joey Hauser only took four, took four shots against Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Joey Hauser was red hot at that time. I don't know how they do it, but they really make guys think once, think twice about taking good, what really I think are good shots, and they're deceptively. I think they make you question yourself by the time you question yourself uh the, the shot window is closed um moving forward i i think the big one of the big things that has been an issue for michigan state all, all year long is not having a not having two fours that's you could say that's part of it you talk about the big lineup the only reason that that big center center lineup is out there is because michigan state's trying to buy time for malik hall because they don't want to play him into the ground sure um, you know, if, if Michigan State had another four man, you wouldn't see that two big lineup out there. Right. It's a it's a it's a safety valve. So Billy Call does not fall apart down the stretch, and it's a real concern with Malik Call. You know, you even saw it in that first half against that Ohio State game. You know, like early on, he was the best thing that all, that Michigan State had going against Ohio State. Then he picks up his second foul. Uh, and he had to sit most of the first half on, on the bench, and that kind of took him out of out of the flow on offense. But Michigan State needs what we call to be the best version of himself. Uh, without a four man, without another four man like a Joey Hauser, they don't have anybody that they really don't have anybody that can stretch the floor. A guy that can play the four, um, except for for Malik Hall, 
you know, you could say Colin Carr, he could play the four, and I'd agree with you. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, mm-hmm. problem with, with that is, is, is because of Jeremy Fears not being available to play point guard minutes. You've got Colin Carr being forced to play minutes at the three, mm-hmm. and that's not ideal for him because Trey Holloman has to play point guard minutes. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's easy to look at look at a roster and say, well, if this guy played more, or if that guy played more, it would be a different different outcome. But you know, there's like a there's like a, a trickle down effect of all these different things. You know, why are two bigs out there? Because Willie Call can't play forty minutes a game, right? And, the, uh, and, without, some, and some people say, going into the tank. and you know, some people say, well, 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 you know, Notre Dame plays guys for 40 minutes. Well, I mean, Michigan State, what they do and they fast break. Michigan State's the number one fast break team in the, in the Big Ten this year. You saw the fast break points in this game. And that's basically what they had going for it. And for 27 years, Michigan State's been counter break team. That's part of what has allowed them to hang eight banners in the in the rafters final four during the Izzo era. And part of that it's very hard to play 40 minutes. No one plays 40 minutes. It's hard to play 38. You got to play 36 to 32 if you're a starter in order for Michigan State's system to run the way it's supposed to be. And I realize rebounding's not been a strength for Michigan State, but Michigan State is still giving a lot of effort there and also trying to give a lot of effort in defense. Defensively, they're third or fourth in the Big Ten in field goal percentage defense and three-point defense, maybe higher in adjusted field goal percentage defense. All those things take a lot of fuel. And that's why Malik Hall can't play 40 minutes. So he's got to sit. So you start Booker with Hall. And like you said, that first shift went long. It went about five solid minutes. So Booker and Hall have to sit now. Now who goes in the game? We already established that you have to sit Hall because he's got to get rest to make sure he's the best version of himself going forward. And if Michigan State wants to fast break, if you go five minutes early, you got to, you got to come out. So, you're, you just played Booker and Hall. They both have to sit. Now who's going in? They go in with Sissoko and um, Cooper. Yeah, so two bigs lineup that everybody hates. But you can't keep Hall in there. Maybe you can for another minute, but he's got to come out. Booker, I mean, he he's just getting used to playing five minutes, and he runs real well, but you could see him getting tired out there a little bit also with the way Michigan State tries to run with the center going – you know, running, running the rim in transition. So you, you, like you said, Carr would be the only other option as a power forward. And he hasn't played power forward in a month for the reasons you mentioned. And Carr is g- giving effort. He's trying to give effort on defense, but in terms of carrying out simple assignments, he's a foot off here and there and allows gaps. So they've, they've, They've shrunk it for him for, for the reasons you mentioned with Fears being out of the lineup and Holloman after playing more point guard. They need Cohen Carr to play, even if it's just eight or nine minutes, to play wing guard, and they and he's still having trouble carrying out those assignments. If you had him playing the wing guard and power forward, you'd have uh you'd it, it would be more problematic. You'd have you'd have more slippage trying to learn those two positions rather than just the one. So I understand why they're doing that, but the two big lineup that everybody hates. Sissoko and Cooper, Paul, I think they played a minute and 59 seconds together in the first half. That's well, it. And everybody and, and wants to, everybody the, wants to blame he, the loss on the, those minute 59 seconds. Now, they did go Kohler and Cooper together for five minutes midway point of the second half. That's a stretch we'll talk about here in a moment, or I will at some point. They, they kind of got caught out there in the court, and there was a pivotal, pivotal time in the game. Are those, is that the two big lineup? That's what you want to call it. Kohler, Paul, my memory's not as good as it used to be. We've been looking at him, wondering if he could ever play the four. Didn't do it at all last year. Izzo said in preseason they'd, they'd be looking at that. Um, maybe he's done it a little bit, but I, I don't know. That might have been the, the first minutes that Kohler's ever played the four in college basketball. And a couple times, he's guarding number 21, the guy that Michigan State recruited to the freshman. I can't think of his name, but you, you, I'm sure you Devin Royal, the guy yeah. that I liked a lot. So, so Kohler's guarding him. First time in his college career, he's, he's guarding a smallish four. Late February, that's where Michigan State is. That's experimental. That's developmental. That's, you know, NASA blowing up rockets, trying to see if they can get to the moon. These are things that Michigan State is trying at this stage, which makes it difficult. The ceiling is still high if they can get to the tournament and they can herd these cats and get it together. But the, the, I guess people would consider that a two-big lineup. But in, in total, I think seven minutes of a two-big lineup and only two minutes of Sissoko, Sissoko and Cooper for people that want to blame the entire game on two minutes, seven minutes into the game in the first half. What were you about to say before before I interrupted you? 
Well, one thing that people don't account for is so. So why why would you play Sissoko in there? It's because Ohio State made a counter move and they brought in Zed Key, the guy that whose whose only appreciable skill is is shooting jump hooks, and he's actually pretty good pretty good at it. They went away from Akpara. The reason why Xavier Booker was able to play 17 minutes at all against Ohio State is because Akpara for Ohio State is not a threat to shoot the ball at all from out, outside, and uh, and he's not really. He's kind of more of a rangy jumper type dude. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, he's he's pretty raw himself. I, I think Michigan State would take him in, you know, in a heartbeat because he can do some things defensively and he's a good shot blocker. But the reason why why Booker's able to play the five in that game is because, you know, Akpar is not. It's not a dude that's going to be able to hit you with a fifteen footer. He's not a go to threat. He averages. Like he's a sophomore. Who averages six points a game, and he's not the most physically imposing guy. Right. He's a good rim protector, but Booker can survive against him if you're going to start. You know, get, throw him a bone and let him start a game to see what it looks like. That that kind of made sense, and he played. And he started well. Had a good opening so, shift. So, so the other thing I would say was, <laughs> what I would say was, you know, I, I took a lot of heat on their in game thread because I was charting during the game, okay, what the rebounding was when Booker was in the game and when he wasn't in the game. Yeah. And like early on, Michigan State was down. Ohio State, when the game was 13 to 8 and Booker went out, Ohio State had a 12 to 4 rebounding advantage over Michigan State. Now, Michigan State ended up, when, when Sissoko came back in, Michigan State ended up edging up and they were like two up on Ohio State uh, right, right before the half. When they built that lead, it's because of the rebounding and they were able to get, get the running game going. They weren't able to run earlier because they couldn't get the rebounds. In that second half, Ohio State started out when Booker was on the floor with a 9-2 rebounding advantage. And I know people are saying, oh, you just hate on Booker. You want to blame Booker for everything that happened out there? I'm just saying that there's different reasons why different guys can play and are, and are, are good fits. This team is a guards team. It always has been. And if guards aren't making shots, it's not going to work. To get anything going down low – Michigan State needs Malik Hall to be Malik Hall. But the the problem is, and one of the things that you have to account for, and that Michigan State has done a pretty good job of this all season long, when Booker has played, when Booker is on the floor, the rebounding is such a drop-off that guards and wings and Malik Hall have to work that much harder to get rebounds. And and, uh, and, and it's not easy. And, 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 so that, and that being said, Tyson Booker, Walker, Tyson ahead. Walker, Tyson Walker is a guy scrapping for rebounds, and I think he might have had four. He played a lot when Booker was out there. Tyson Walker might have had four rebounds at half, three rebounds at half. And I could see when he plays with Booker, Tyson Walker goes extra hard to the glass because he knows if he doesn't get it or a guard doesn't get it, it's going to be a, it's going to be a putback. And that's one of the things that people need to be honest about, you know, with, with what's going on. Yeah, a guy can hit a three. A guy can – block a shot when someone's taking it right at him, but he's not a rim protector. I mean, he's up in the air all the time. Yeah. You're going to get a fair amount of blocks because you're that long, but is that the defense isn't working as well as it could, uh, you know, if it's under control and then it's being played in the system, but Michigan state has to, we're talking about guys that don't have energy. Tyson Walker doesn't have the energy right now to expand on being a, uh, or a rebounder in addition to trying to play two ways with a groin injury. Um, you know, Michigan state needs Malik Hall to be, to be a rebounder, but they also need him to score, score as well. They don't need, you know, guys necessarily picking up slack for, for someone that can't rebound with two, with two hands. Now I do think that there were a couple of occasions that I saw Booker actually rebound the ball. Well, mm-hmm. I mean like with two hands with it, when his eyes are in the right place, so that's all progress, but you can't risk you can't risk risk at this time of year. I'll go back to what I said when we started started this. There is a big difference between guys like you know Tillman, you know guys like Draymond Green as freshmen, and those guys knew basketball. Those guys had really good court awareness for whatever other flaws that they possessed. They had good court awareness. They've been um, they understood the game of basketball. They understand how guys move and where, what, you know, just the flow of the game. That's a, that's not a strength for, for Booker. He's getting better through practice. He's gaining confidence. Mm-hmm. And Michigan State has been very, you know, like Thomas has been very transparent with him throughout the whole process. Um, and, and 
I, I give Israel a lot of credit for putting the mm-hmm. amount of time that he's put in to make, making sure that this kid gets where he thinks he can get. Mm-hmm. He said earlier this week that he expects Booker to be a superstar next yeah. year. Mm-hmm. Now, that, that was that. high praise. That was high praise. That was high praise from from Tom Izzo. Now, that, sometimes that's wishful thinking. Mm-hmm. I think Booker's got a long a long way to go. But as he gains strength, as he gains awareness from being, you know, from having his eyes in the right place, um, you know, he's going to be a, a, a good player. But Michigan State um, doesn't need this time of year to be playing for who's going to stay on on roster, right. who's not, who's who's who you're worried about transferring. That, that's how that's how you know you lose your program. Mm-hmm. That, that's why Kentucky finds in, in, in some in some teams in like bottom line, some teams are better matchups. Mm-hmm. For Booker than other teams, Ohio State's a great matchup. I, I don't think you know with Akpara when he's on the floor. I don't think because um, they're not going to capitalize on know, Booker's Purdue's weaknesses. Because they're not going to they're not gonna capitalize on Booker's weaknesses. Ohio State. You're right. That's why it's exactly. a favorable. You know, matchup. you know, and there's other there's other there's other teams out there like that too. You know, like teams that are like really flawed. I, I look at a team like a Maryland. You know, that doesn't have they didn't have a whole lot of shooters. They have one mm-hmm. two guys that you have to count for. You know. But Purdue is not a team like that. And, you know, I thought one of the things that, that was asked at practice yesterday, and, um, you know, I know like a lot of subscribers and a lot of Michigan State fans think this, that if you can draw a big man like Zach Eady out from the basket with a five man that can shoot, um, it, it's some sort of magical bullet against Purdue. Well, guess what? Purdue's not going to Purdue's not gonna send Zach Eady out to guard Xavier Booker. They're just going to have it. They're just going to, like Izzo said as much yesterday, they're just going to come in with a 6'8 athletic guy that's tougher than him. You know, and I just I just think that people, people oversimplify. As a human species, we oversimplify everything. If A doesn't work, the opposite has to work. You know they don't they don't think of the gray area and there you know there's so many different moving parts on a well, the un, in a basketball the, the, un, the unknown and, is undefeated uh, the unknown is undefeated the unknown is undefeated and, and with, eight, with eight minutes to go and it's a six point game and you're the coach you're like hey should we put Booker in there for the first time in his life and nut crunching minutes and and win or lose with him as being one of the five or do we go with Matty Sissoko regardless of what you think about him who's been on the court 40 times in these situations. And you could say Sissoko has struggled lately, but he'd been playing pretty well with his, within his role for this game, which is all they needed. Let him play his role to keep make sure the boat doesn't float so that Aikens, Walker, and Hall, and maybe Hogard, they would be the ones with the ball in their hands to decide it. Well, and they were the ones with the balls in their hands to decide it, and it didn't work out for them. But you go with Sissoko. Say what you want about Sissoko, but he was a starting center playing a lot of minutes, as was Cooper last year for a team that went into overtime that was that close to get into the Elite Eight. It's the other four that decide it the way this team is constructed and the way Sissoko's development hasn't really panned out like maybe he or they hoped, definitely. So, But he's still a guy that last year as a sophomore could keep the boat afloat so other four guys could des- decide it and they had a chance to win it at the buzzer in regulation against Kansas State to go to the Elite Eight. That's still the same guy. So to think that he can't provide that right now with seven minutes to go with a six-point lead, you definitely go with Sissoko. And he was solid enough in the late going that they kept him in there, and I think that was the right decision. The, the 10 minutes prior to that, we can talk yeah. about that in a moment, but Sissoko, I thought, was the, was the right decision. It's just, uh, you know, Michigan State ended up going three for 12 from the field with four turnovers in the last 10, 14 minutes. 10 minutes, 14 seconds to go. The rest of the game, three of 12 from the field, four turnovers, and it was the guards who didn't come through. It wasn't the five position. Go ahead, Paul. I mean, did he do his job? I mean, that, that's okay. So that, that, that's what you have to ask every player. Not not how you feel about whether some guy has upside in comparison to other, other guys. What is Sosoko's job? His job is to rebound the basketball and play defense. Did he do his job? He did his job against Ohio State. B- bottom line. Jaden Akins, did he do his job? His job is to make shots. No, he didn't do his job. Uh, Akins played good did, defense, and he had and he kept one key offensive he, rebound alive. He did alive. play good defense, and, it, and and he did. Like I wrote ahead of time on that game that he needed to do. He and Malik Call both needed to do a good job with the fifty fifty plays, mm-hmm. and and play with effort on both ends of the floor. I felt certainly that both those guys did that mm-hmm. did that in the first half. I thought yes. Akins played good enough on defense. He made enough hustle plays to overcome his lack of shooting. Yes, down the stretch in this game though, 
And Big Ten games are going to get close. I don't care how good a team you are. You're going to have close games, even with teams that everybody thinks you should beat by 10 or, 10 or 20 points. It just happens. You have to make – you have to make winning plays on defense and you have to make shots. Michigan state didn't make shots. It has nothing to do with the five that was on the floor. It has everything to do with guards. Um, you know, not, not knocking down, knocking down jumpers. And, you, and, and people, I don't know people, what, I, I don't know what else to tell you. People will say, well, you know, they need to have a center that can, can score and be a threat and they don't have a threat to get it down low and, and do things or shoot. Well, that's true, but they don't have that card in their hand. And then you can say, well, then the problem is with roster construction, how this team is put together. And you can say, yeah, that might be true. And Sissoko has kind of leveled off a little bit, but you know, unknown is undefeated. If Jackson Kohler doesn't get injured, what kind of player is he at this point? So I'm not sure roster construction well, yeah. is a huge error either. If everybody stays healthy, go ahead. The other thing I would say is, is you know, every, the one thing that people don't pay attention to is Xavier Booker didn't even start the season out at the five. Right. He started out the season as, as a four. Right. So it's not like he's been sitting there at the – it's not like he's been sitting there playing five all season and not being used. He's a guy that started out the four because he wasn't physically able to play the five. And they basically have – they, they basically it. have two power forwards on the roster, basically. Hall – and Booker. Yeah. And they started both of them. So that was my point earlier. So that if you start both of them, then they both sit. Then you have no choice but to go with 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 two centers. Or unless you go one center and four guards, but you, you don't have a lot of guards now either. So that, that's what led to those dominoes. Go ahead, Paul. The biggest flaw on this team, you, you think with Michigan State, the two biggest who are the two biggest positions on the on the Michigan State basketball team when you look at traditional success that Michigan State has had, point guard. And, and usually they're at their best when they have a point guard that can shoot the basketball, get a shot, make a shot with the shot clock wearing down, not just drive to the basket, but a guy that can hit a jumper. So point guard and AJ Hogarth is a good point guard. He's, he's good enough in my opinion, not a great shooter, but he can do some stuff at the, at the rim, but point guard's a huge position. The second, the, the second position that I think is the most important would be the four man, just because of, what the four man does to stretch the floor and also what the four man does defensively. He's always been when Michigan state's had their best, some of the best teams. And I go back to, to, you know, like uh, Kenny Goins and Xavier Tillman. Tillman is a five, but he can defend fours and whatnot. Michigan state was such an elite defensive team in the NCAA tournament run to the final, to the final four in 2019, because they had two dudes and Xavier Tillman and Kenny Goins that can defend just about anybody. And, you know, including, Michigan State, including Zion Williamson. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And I was talking with, uh, you know, I was talking with, uh, with Jake Lascala the other day and I was like, say, man, that's one of the things that, that Michigan State not having two capable fours is, is a problem for, for this team. You know, Malik Hall is a guy that I think is capable of doing some of the defensive things that a Kenny Goins could. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Malik Hall doesn't play with the edge that either Xavier Tillman did defensively or Kenny Goins did defensively. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, you know, that's, that's something, but the fact that Michigan state doesn't have a floor stretching four is the biggest, is the biggest problem on this team. It has been since day one and it puts a whole lot of stuff on, on, on guards, but I'm talking about a floor stretching four that can play defense functionally as well. It's not good enough to hit a three. You've got to be able to do a whole lot of things to be a successful four in the Michigan State program. That's where Michigan State has fallen short, in my opinion. Yeah. Not having not having a floor stretcher. Malik Hall can do a lot of really good things, but the, but the turning down open shots at times to dribble into traffic, you can't do that against Ohio State. You can't do that against rim protection, and that that to me not having. It's, it would be nice to have a guy that can shoot and play defense, as well as a guy that could do some stuff inside. Malik Hall's had a great, a great season, but Michigan State's not at its functional best as an offense in the half court without that floor stretching element. I, I, I think would, that's I a would, bigger res- problem than any anything I, anything I, that people see at the five. Yeah, I, I agree that the stretch four is so important. We've been watching that all year, but Malik Hall has um, developed his off the dribble and medium range game more than I expected. And I think he's been a, a good player, plus oh, player. Yeah. And I don't think that's the biggest problem on the team. I think that he's not provided that stretch four ability like you're talking about. His percentage is good, but he turns down a lot of shots. I mean, he's shooting like 36% from three or something. He's been productive. It's it's increased. But um, 
I, I you know, I, I good I, defensive teams. Good defensive teams are going to give him the are, you know, Iowa. You saw Iowa do it. They're just giving him that three line. Mm-hmm. And that clogs other things up. You can do things to get him the ball. You can do some things to get him the ball inside, but but it puts a. And you did see Ohio if you're State not going to have this stretch element when, when they when they had that key. Steal. If you're not going to have if you're not going to have that guy that can. When uh, you if know, you don't have the guy that can hit that deep deep three ball, it yeah. puts a whole lot of pressure on guards to make shots and you've got to have guards that you've got to have three guards that are scoring double figures and have a guy like a Tyson Walker that's able to score 20, 25, 30 points when they need him to. Sure. You can't do that right now. And I thought you made a great point about Walker not quite being himself. And, you know, Izzo was asked yesterday, how healthy is he? And Izzo was like, well, you, you know, ask him. Cause I think Walker might not like it when people talk about his health. Cause he doesn't want the opponents to know what's going on. But Izzo initially said no comment and then said, every time it goes down, he's, he gets up holding his groin. And, there was there was a play. Um, let's see. I mean, there there, there were times when um, Michigan State ran a play. Let's see, about two forty five to go, two thirteen to go. Ended up Hall um, tried the spin dribble and and ended up getting it stolen from him, which I think is something Ohio State did a good job, as all teams do in the Big Ten. Scouting reports, film work, taking away your strength. And Hall has been very good off the dribble. Now you're seeing a team like Ohio State play f- as, 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 as Hall got it with the shot clock down to six, trying to create his own shot, going to a spin dribble. And there was a help defender right there to steal it on the spin dribble, 213 to go. Earlier in that set, Michigan State uh, you know, ran kind of a newish play. A lot of times they save a lot of new plays for the last six or seven minutes. And in this game, their new wrinkles didn't work very well. Um, and part of it is because, like you said, Hawker uh, Walker it doesn't have the juice like he usually does. You know, they came out, it was kind of a, a mover blocker type of thing, had a shuffle cut, and they had Sissoko doing a pin down for Walker. Walker's going to come out for a catch and shoot. Ohio State was ready for it. They overplayed the pin down, and Walker tried to set up that screen, but he doesn't. He wasn't moving like Tyson Walker with that, that quickness. And he's easier to cover away from the ball because he's, he's conserving and he's hurting and he's playing through pain. So Ohio State was on that, expecting it was, it was going to go to Walker. And they kind of overplayed him and, and it didn't get Walker open. So shot clock's running down. Malik Call tries to create something on his own with five seconds left on the, on the left side. Spin dribble gets it stolen. But to your point, that was not full blast Tyson Walker that they were trying to go to in that moment. And, you know, later in the game when... Um, when Walker ended up, or Hogard ended up driving, um, th- it looked like Michigan State was um, trying to uh, throw it to Aikens on a down screen. You know, they they kind of do that that ghost ball screen, and then it's a pin down in the old um, Joey Hauser mid range play. They're doing it for Aikens, comes off a screen. But meanwhile, Michigan State ran a ball screen switch, uh, ran a ball screen, and the guy guarding Malik Hall, the power forward, Mahaffey or whatever his name is, ends up switching, and now he's guarding Hogard. And you could tell Hogard had the executive decision that if they switch and Mahaffey guards you, Hogard, you can take it to the rack. He took it to the rack and missed. But if uh, uh, Hogard had the decision there, he could have gone to Aikens on a catch-and-shoot 16-footer, going away from Walker a little bit going to Aikens, and that's an opportunity that they set up for Aikens as a primary. He never got the ball, never got a chance to shoot. Maybe he misses that shot, I don't know. But all of those things go together. They didn't go to Walker there, you know, maybe because of the the the, the, the mo- mobility questions. Secondly, Hogard makes an executive decision. I don't fault him on that. Thirdly, Aikens doesn't get the, the shot opportunity that, that X's and O's wise that they drew up for him, um, you know, might have might have changed the game. All those things happen. And, um, and and ends up being an empty possession and one of the three of 12 possessions. And just every button you're pushing <clears throat> has a little empty factor on it there a little bit. But, Paul, I think you have to go. You have to get going, if I'm not mistaken. Any other thoughts before you leave us? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, one last thing I want to say is Devin Royal, the kid that really kind of exploded in that game, I've watched several Ohio State games and he hasn't done a whole lot. I watch him in particular because I really, really liked him. Um, last year, and I think Michigan State should have should have brought him into the into the class. It, I'm not. I can't remember what the scholarship allocation was. I, I know that 
he really likes Michigan State, but he has got a really high basketball IQ, a good rebounder, and he's just like a confident guy that's a really good passer. And you saw that at the, at the end of the game. But the one thing that kind of st- stood out to me, and I, I don't want to speak out of turn here, but uh, you know where when you sit at games, you know like play by play or the the color guy from Michigan State at radio, Matt Segingo was like he didn't he had no idea who. Devin Royal was because he wasn't on the Michigan State scouting report. So you talk about some of the issues that he created. Michigan State didn't prepare to play Devin Royal because he doesn't play very much. And for a team that prides itself on being as thorough as Michigan State is, it it just goes to show that there are some times where you don't know, you, you know, you can't prepare for everything, or you're not mm-hmm. prepared for a guy to come out of nowhere and, and beat you. And Devin many, Royal did a lot of things. What did to beat Royal, Michigan State. He scored 14 points. Is that what he scored? <clears throat> is that what it was? How many? Yeah. Have you... And he hasn't done remote. He hasn't done. He hasn't done remotely. Fifteen points. Uh, the big thing that he did is I think he threw the outlet pass uh, to Dale Bonner. Um, you know, and, and set up that 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 three at the end, mm-hmm. um, the game winning three. Mm-hmm. But he also scored a bunch of points, mm-hmm. and, and Michigan State was not prepared at all for what he brought to the and table. Like, like you said, that's an unscouted look. He's not on the scouting report. Like you said, Izzo and this team prides itself on getting into your playbook, knowing what you're going to do and getting there and taking it away from you. They would rather have you have your best players and have their plan match against your best players than an unscouted look and some crap shoot situation coming out there. And that's what happened. And, uh, and, and, and Royal made them pay. And in some of those, Royal was uh, you know being guarded by Kohler. I guarantee that was nothing they went they went over in the pregame. That's you got Kohler at the four. Yeah, the, you're you're the doing that for that, the first time, and then you're guarding six foot six Devin the one Royal, thing that was, and you've got no scout on what what his moves are and everything. Then you're just then you're then it's Moneyball, you know. The one thing that I would say about about Royal and, and Michigan State's not, Michigan State's not going to put this in the scouting report because Tom is a Washington play for all Ohio Red. But I'll see one of the things that, that Devin Royal did, he was kind of like that point forward. Ohio, all Ohio Red always has like a has like an undersized four that can shoot threes, rebound the heck out of the ball. And he also is getting the ball and he's he's handling a lot. Devin Royal, uh, I believe he was a leading assist guy for the for the all Ohio Red team that he played. You have to tell people so what all Ohio that Red. There's people has, watching the, Paul, there's people watching that don't know what all Ohio oh, Red I, is. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The, the 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 flag the flagship Nike Elite Basketball Youth uh EYBL program in the state of Ohio. It's Summer the number team. one Summer grassroots team. basketball program in the state of Ohio. Michigan State recruits them heavily. Ohio State does. Everybody does. And uh, and they've always got a four man or a big man that can put the ball on the floor. Doesn't mean he's going to do it in college. Javon Best was that guy for all Ohio Red back in the day. Uh, you know, he, he, he didn't do much as a point forward at Michigan State. But they've always had that guy. And Devin Royal had his day against Michigan State. A good kid, and I'm happy for him because he's worked his tail off, stuck with it. All right, so what happens next? What, what about the Purdue he's game? Fewer... What's going on with the Purdue game, Northwestern game? What do you see for Michigan State charting out? What's next? Well, Purdue's going to be a, a, a house of hell. Uh, it always is at, at Mackey. You know, I don't care what you do with Zach Eady. You might as well let him have his points because if you, if you sag off him, guys like Gillis or whomever is, is going to be lighting, up the, like, lighting it up from three. They always shoot uh, great from three down, down at Mackey, Michigan state winning down there would probably be less likely than Ohio state winning at Michigan state. Mm -hmm. In my, in my opinion, the the games that they have to win Northwestern in Indiana, Indiana is no, is no cakewalk. They've Mm -hmm. got their own issues, but if Xavier Johnson comes back from injury, that's a point guard that Indiana has that can stir the drink for him. That's one of the biggest issues that Indiana has faced. They're playing Trey. They're playing Trey Galloway, a two guard that can't shoot free throws as their point guard, and he's has a lot of real serious confidence issues. Mm-hmm. Xavier Johnson comes back. That's a completely different Indiana team. We all know that Northwestern is down uh, one player, but Northwestern also has enough players to hurt Michigan State. Never underestimate Northwestern. They Michigan State brings out the best in those dudes. And that's going to be that's going to be an absolute dogfight. Michigan State needs to win that game. They need to win the Indiana game. Otherwise, in my opinion, Michigan State puts itself in a position where they could be this year's Rutgers, a team that everyone thought would be in the tournament, but isn't. Mm-hmm. Now I know that's dire and whatnot, but it it doesn't take much to go from being a team that's considered in. You assume Michigan State's in 
to see in the streak end. And Michigan State can't do that. They have to play with a sense of urgency. They have to w- find a way to get it done. But bottom line, guards have to make shots. And they aren't going to win games that they need to win unless guards make shots. That's either Aikens or Walker or both. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's, I think that's what I'm going to be watching. I, I don't know what's going to happen to Purdue. Mm-hmm. I think they're going to get waxed. Mm-hmm. But I want to see Jaden Aikens hit some jumpers. I want to see Trey Holloman hit some jumpers. Mm. Um, because Michigan State needs shooters right now. <clears throat> that's what's got to yeah. happen moving forward. And Holloman really struggled during that key five-minute stretch midway through the second half. We'll get to that in a moment. But, Paul, I really appreciate your time. I know you have to get somewhere. Right. appreciate the time that you've had here on the podcast, and we'll see you soon. Thanks a lot for all your hard work this weekend and your expertise. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Take care, Jim. All right. Thanks a lot. So uh, we had a call a moment ago, and if anyone wants to call, anyone wants to call, we will we'll open up the lines. I know people don't usually call during the afternoon, and even less, at, you know, they don't call much at night because of – uh, people would rather text. I understand that, but anyone that wants to call, they can go ahead. I'll put that line, that number up here. Six one six four three nine one one five eight. I'll say this about um, some of the stuff w- uh, regarding Xavier Booker, and I said this on the Stout Show a few minutes ago. And Booker is he's been practicing well. And last week at the underground or at the final forum message board at SpartanMag.com, I posted after practice on Thursday, I think it was, or maybe it was. I remember. I don't remember what day it was. Maybe t- Tuesday. I don't remember what day it was. It was some day last week. And I posted on the message board that that Xavier Booker just had the best practice I've ever seen him have. Now he wasn't great, but he was just good and made some finishes and did the things you see him play in games. This is what I said in the Stout Show. And I've been saying it on this show for a long time, going back a year, year and a half. Um, Xavier Booker's made a lot of progress. I've been saying that here in the last few weeks. And I, I've got great respect for him as a young man. He's got his head on straight. He's working hard. You can see that he's improved. And he's trying to improve. And he's aware. He's self-aware. He was aware of where he needed to work, what he needed to work on. Things that he wasn't, was, he didn't know he needed to work on those things earlier when he came to Michigan State. But... Um, He's been making progress. Call from George. To accept, press one. All right, we'll to see what George has to say. We're, we're not, not, he's calling from uh, Illinois. George from Illinois, you are on the air. SpartanMag.com, welcome to the show. Hey, Jim, massive fan, dude. Thank you so much for having my call. Thanks a lot, George. What's up? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, man, these next few games are going to be some of the most important games of the whole season. Mm-hmm. Um, I think everybody can agree on that. Um, but I, I've been telling some of my friends here recently, um, after the loss to the Ohio State and the loss to Iowa, honestly, man, I I'm still have faith that we'll make the tournament. And I've been telling some of my friends that, honestly, I think the worst seed that we have in the tournament, maybe the farther of a run we get, we need sort of – uh, we have this sort of like mentality that for the underdogs, I assume we like perform better. Um, at least from from what I've seen in my past few years watching MSU basketball, I sort of wanted to get your idea on what you thought of that. I think that's possible, but this team's like herding cats, like I've been saying, and they're having trouble harnessing a level of consistency. All those cliches and. The Walker, like Paul Conan, I just said, the Walker who scored 30 points last year against Purdue, if that Walker's available, then this team's ceiling of potential is they're capable of scoring an upset in the second round if they get in the tournament and if they win the first game. But without that Walker, this team's ceiling is not as high because Aikens is even more, yeah. uh, you know, Aikens is, you know, he gets shots, but it's it's a crapshoot. Some go in, some don't, and it's there's really not much rhyme or reason for how he's going to play. And Hogard, you know, he does some things to the rim, but not as much this year because you don't have Joey Hauser spacing the floor. Malik Hall's doing some good things, right. having some really good games. Mm-hmm. Not the floor spacer that Hauser was, but he's better in the medium range than Hauser was and a better defensive player than Hauser was. Not as good as a rebounder. But if Tyson Walker is not there to be the dynamic first-team All-Big Ten type of senior guard that yeah. you need then, yeah, the, the ceiling is lower. If he's healthy, which I'm not sure it's ever going to happen this year again, if he's available, yeah, I think they could. That. Now, in the second round, you're talking about possibly playing, you know, if Michigan State gets in and they're a nine seed, I'd rather be a 10 than a nine. If you're a 10, then exactly. in the second round, second round you might be playing Iowa State. You know, you might be playing, I don't know, 
Kansas, who's had their ups and downs. If you're an eight or a nine in the second round, you're probably playing UConn or Houston. I'd rather be a right. 10. I'd be, give right. me, be a 10. Give That's me a I've seven. To get in the seven, let me play a number seven seed like, I don't know, Florida or something or South Carolina. That You could lose, but your chances of going to the Sweet yeah. 16 are better as a 10 than they are as an eight. Yeah. Yeah, and that's I, you just said it exactly the way I've been I've been wanting to say it to my friends. Um, they've been all calling me crazy, um, and yeah, dude. And I honestly I thought we were extremely overrated with that. I think we started the season at a four or something like that, something yeah. ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, I agree. Like we're all overrated. Um, but yeah, man, thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks a lot, George. Have a great day. Thanks for calling. Hey, you too. All right. That's George from Kankakee, Illinois. Good to have him on the air. I'll put the number back up there again. And I'll finish my thought about um, Xavier Booker. And I've got great respect for him. I've been impressed with his ability to take coaching and to stay positive and show up to practice and work and improve. And you see, not only has he added 20 pounds and, and improved himself physically, but rebounding-wise... Conan Dyke mentioned what the stats were when he was on the court, and I wasn't aware of that. But I like what Booker's doing rebounding-wise. Shot goes up. He's putting a body on somebody. The body that he has, he's sealing defensive boards, trying to. He's mindful of it. Offensive rebounds, he's trying to get to the offensive boards. But defensively, he's bending his knees and mindfully putting a body on somebody, which people, I'm telling you, was not in his nature. It wasn't something he was accustomed to doing in high school or in grassroots basketball. He would try to get some range rebounds here and there if it came to him, but he would he was allergic to contact. He's a lot thinner back then. He's bending his knees on the weak side. He's aware. He's been good from the beginning in terms of lateral movement, which they've incorporated into his ball screen coverage, and he moves well laterally. But in terms of the way you change ball screen defenses from player to player and sometimes from timeout to timeout, that can be a bit much for veteran centers. We've seen veteran centers never get a hold of that, and they end up out of the playing group. His lateral movement and his wingspan, those things, give him a chance to be a good ball screen defender eventually. And He's moving pretty well right now. And you can see he can react and block shots, so that's useful too. But... Having his knees bent on the weak side and, 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 and getting to areas is so much better than it used to be. He used to like have this habit of like jumping up and down like a pogo stick anytime he went to change directions. If he's going from here to there, first he would jump up and, the down, uh, up and down and get there late. Jump up and down, get there late. Change of possession, transition, jump up and down late, late, late. He's not doing that anymore. They've shown that to him on film, and he's broken himself of that habit as he's gotten bigger. Bending his knees on the weak side, being aware. All those things are so much better. He was better in October so much better than he was the previous March. And I mentioned this, this on the radio show, and I, didn't, I never mentioned this before. I don't think I've mentioned this before, but like after two weeks of practice, I saw him, and he, he was just a lot better than he used to be. And I, But still not close to being in the playing group. This is October. And after practice, I told Izzo, I said, man, you and the coaches are not going to get the, you're not going to get the credit for the job you're doing with Booker. People are not going to understand how much better he is right now in October than he was in March of his senior year. He kind of laughed because people saw the the ranking and assumed he would be ba- Paulo Bancaro coming in here or uh, the Wilson kid from Alabama last year. It wasn't going to happen, and I cautioned people to be patient with him. Be patient. And he, he had uh, such a long way to go in October – and, and I'm going to use these words not as disre- dis- disrespect to Booker. Got great respect for him because he's a good guy and he's trying and he's making progress and he's got his head on straight and he got all those things. And it's all going to add up to a, a great player next year, which like Conor Dyke said earlier, I wasn't sure what ever happened, but it's his, his coachability and his mental approach to it is going to allow him to um, – capture his level of potential someday because he's, he's doing all the right things. But people that see him now, you know, maybe he should have played a few more minutes on Sunday. We'll get into that in a moment. But if you see him now, do not assume that the player you see now in Xavier Booker is the player that he was in December. He would, this was not the Booker in December. He didn't get many minutes then. And if you were saying he needed to get minutes then, he, he didn't and he couldn't and he shouldn't. This Booker didn't exist in December. The Booker in October was horrific as a basketball player. Good kid, but... And then he improved from October, November to going from horrific to just terrible. 
And then he went from terrible to bad in December and January. Then he went from bad to not quite ready in late January, early February. I say this as a person in myself who's a terrible basketball player, and Booker is already way better at basketball than I'll ever be at anything. He started for a Michigan State basketball team. There's not many people walking the planet that can do that. So all respect to him and his and his his mental approach and who he is as a young man. Great respect for that. I'm just saying this to the fans who think that Booker should have been playing in December. People, he wasn't ready. But he steadily improved from horrific to terrible to bad to not ready to almost ready. Now he's ready to play minutes, regular minutes. And last week after practice, I posted the final forum, and I said he just had the best practice I've ever seen from him. Becoming more and more responsible, accountable, it's coming together. I wasn't sure that would happen. I really didn't think it was going to happen this year at all. Back in November, I'm like, it's not going to happen. And some people said it would happen in late February, and they were right. Like Rod said that. He said late February, he could come around. And that's the trajectory it's on right now. And um, I mentioned on this show last week that something could happen with this team where you get late season development from players. Like Izzo talked about last week, Draymond Green did not play much early in his freshman year, played more and more and more, became a sixth man, an important part of that 2010 Final Four team, playing a lot of minutes, like 20-plus minutes at the end coming off the bench. Xavier Tillman played more as his freshman year uh, went along. And the guy that I've made comparisons to, not as a player, but in terms of trajectory of improvement, I mentioned Erasm Lorbeck. In 2003, didn't do much of anything for two-thirds of the season. Really was an impact player in March as Michigan State went to this to the Elite Eight. Paul Davis that year also played more minutes and was up and down wildly, but late in the year harnessed a level of productive consistency. And so did Maurice Hager as a freshman in 2003. So I mentioned here a few weeks ago that I did, was not closing the door on Booker potentially doing that. And I think that door is more open I, I, I think there's even more of a chance of that happening. There will be opponents that he will not match up well against, but we've not really seen um, him totally get in, undressed that way, and he's gotten better knowing where to try to put the body he has, the slight body that he has, on people, and he's, he's doing a good job on that, which is enabling him to become more part of the playing group. So I think he could pull a lower back, and I think Kohler could as well. Kohler, I realize, is not a freshman, but he kind of still is because he missed two-thirds of the season with the injury. So developmentally, he was still kind of at that freshman level. He looked good with a post-up shot in this game, took his time, turned around jumper. It's probably the most comfortable I've seen him in the post all year. This game, they played him at the four a little bit, which I mentioned earlier. It might have been the first time in his career he's played the four, which he's, he, he's got stretch four of a shooting ability that you'll see later in his career. Haven't seen it yet, but he can shoot pretty well. Kohler can face up. Uh, in terms of playing defense, he has enough trouble lateral movement playing ball screen defense. It's a five. Not playing defense, it's a four. It's even more difficult, especially if the other team goes small at the four like they did with Royal. And he he got a hand in his face, but Royal made a couple of fadeaway shots that weren't on the scouting report. They didn't go over that film. They didn't have him, you know, Kohler, what they were getting ready, ready him, preparing him for in that game. None of it included playing defense on Royal. But that's how it ended up. So anyway, let's go here to the questions, then I'll get back into some more specifics from that game that we'll talk about. I want to get back to the opening question today. Someone said, what are the biz- biggest possible weaknesses for Michigan State's football team? And I was talking about uh, the wide receiver position. I, you know, I mentioned running backs. I mean, it's not a weakness. Nathan Carter's there. Berger is probably there. Mangum, healthy there. Quarterback, you have Childs. Tight end, you have Velling and Parachek coming around. Uh, you know, at wide receiver, that would be probably the... A potential weakness but Glover coming along now getting into a second and third second season he could probably take an uptick could be pretty good Montori Foster another year solid solid plus receiver possibly TJ Sheffield not sure I, I, I'm not anticipating he's gonna be part of this team a guy with more than 100 receptions at Purdue not sure that all the things are going to get done they, they make try to continue to work at it but it's an uphill climb there you know Antonio Gates is there I'm interested to see in the spring what the new coaches think of Isaiah Johnson and Jalen Smith and I realize that Courtney Hawkins is still around as wide receivers coach he recruited those guys I liked their high school film a lot Jalen Smith traveled at the end of the year I don't think Isaiah Johnson did but I think they have ability still unproven players 
And, you know, like it or not, Elante Brown was a guy that had 17 catches at Nebraska two years ago. Last year, everything he did, he was kind of snake bit. He has some ability to be a guy that can catch the ball a little bit. Just, a, you know, just kind of a guy, maybe a possession receiver type of guy. He's supposed to have really good speed. Haven't really seen that yet, but he struggled on special teams. We all know that. So wide receiver, in comparison to what Michigan State's been in the past, might be the biggest drop-off weakness area. Offensive line, you've got Brandon Baldwin, Luke Newman coming in at right. To, you know, Luke Newman, I thought looked his film looks really good. I know it's Holy Cross, and I watched one game against Dartmouth or something. I realize you're only going against Dartmouth or whatever, but he's a guy who's six foot five and moves well. Luke Newman, I is is going to be, he's going to play. He might uh, he'll compete to start. He's not on campus yet, but. He's a good addition. Tanner Miller coming in at guard or center. Vandermark's healthy at guard. He's functional, functional plus. Ethan Boyd, it's his time there at right tackle to, to step up and do something. So I think offensive line, weakness, I wouldn't call it a weakness. The question was, what's the biggest weakness on the team? I look at an offensive line, Baldwin, Miller, Vandermark, Boyd, Fincher. Not terrible. And with the new offensive line coach, new strength coach, and the, the way this team, the new coaching staff, for football, really, uh, their calling card is physicality on that offensive line. Excellent, proven offensive line coach in Mahalchik. I don't think it's a weakness. Now, there, there's a lot of unproven players there. You know, Stanton Ramil's coming back from injury. Can he do Can he do much to help? Dellinger coming back from injury. Can he do much to help? Gavin Brosh is coming back from injury. Can he do much to help? Is Ashton Lepo ready to get in the playing group? You know, I'm listing 15 offensive linemen, but those those top five are, um, I think, pretty pretty solid. I don't know if Fincher's going to be the starting center. It could be Tanner Miller. That'll be an interesting competition. I mean, Tanner Miller's going to start. Is he going to start at guard or is he going to start at center? Does Fincher move to guard? Does Miller play center as positional leadership? It's all going to be intriguing to see how it all shapes out. But there's some pieces there that aren't terrible. Throw him in there for the new strength coach, new offensive line coach. I'll be eager to see how that looks. Kind of reminds me of year one with Nick Saban, except this team has more returning players. Year one with Nick Saban in 1995, they just graduated a lot of players in 94. They graduated Shane Hanna, Mark Berkmeyer, and um, Brian, uh, Brian DeMarco, and the redheaded guy from Ohio. Can't think of his name. Anyway, to Brett Lorius, I think. So, graduated a lot of guys that you know didn't quite reach their potential at Michigan State collectively. Next year, new offensive line coach Jim Bowman, new strength coach Ken Manny, and all of a sudden these offensive linemen you'd never heard of, including Flozell Adams. You'd heard of him, but he was he's kind of floundering with the previous staff. Flozell Adams gets some traction. Jason Strayhorn comes out of nowhere. Gets a lot of traction at center. Brian Musalem comes out of nowhere, becomes a good guard. Matt Beard comes out of nowhere, becomes a good guard. So I I, I think that type of thing could happen again. I've seen it happen before. The first year coach, first year strength coach, first year offensive line coach. Offensive line, I don't I, I'm not gonna put it down as a as a weakness. Defensive line, you know, Simeon Barrow last year and Derek Harmon, I didn't think took that step that I expected. They were they were they were good in 2022, and in 2023 they were still good. They didn't go to quite good or very good. I think they could. New strength coach, that could help. You know, fourth defensive line coach in four years, I think. But Barrow and Harmon have have more ceiling. Defensive tackle could should be fine. Maverick Hansen still around, venerable stalwart player. You're bringing in Daquan Dows, who had 20 stars at Georgia Tech. Good, solid defensive tackle. Those four should be solid. I don't know what's going to happen with Van Sumeren. Has some quickness. Be intriguing to see how his development goes. But defensive tackle is not going to be a weakness. Defensive end, Jalen Thompson was a bright spot last year as a freshman. Coming back, he'll be adding some strength. Avery Dunn is a guy that started before. Not a plus player, but he's a guy. Defensive end, Quinn Dunnigan coming in from Middle Tennessee State. Second team all conference USA. Solid. Chris Bogle coming back. Solid. I don't know what's going to happen with By Job. I don't know what's going to happen with DePape. Guys that have some... Horsepower, but they've got to learn to play football and toe the line, do some things. I don't think D line's going to be a weakness, people. Linebackers, I was concerned about linebackers, but they went to the portal. Jordan Turner, 18 starts at Wisconsin, should be functional. Wayne Matthews coming in from what, Old Dominion? Watched him on film. He's a guy 
not great, but you, you've got Jordan Hall coming back, and you've got Jordan Turner. Jordan Hall is going to go, you know, become a sophomore, freshman year. Came along real, you know, real nicely. Great leader, excellent young man, type of guy you want in your program. Jordan Hall, solid. You got Cal Halliday still around at two positions. You got Hall, Turner, Halliday. You got Wayne Matthews in there. Darius Snow, not sure what's going to become a become him I think linebackers okay Nickelback I've heard Angelo Gross has been playing there a little bit I heard that at the outset of winter I'm not sure if that's still going to be the case but you've got I'm sure I'm sorry I've heard Dylan Tatum is in there the nickel situation got Angelo Gross still around I could see Angelo Gross becoming a, a good player in this system we've talked about it before I think that they had so much volume in, in the previous previous system that it blew the speakers of some people I've been over that before. I might go over it later some other time, but not today. But Gross, a guy with experience, Nickelback or Tatum, not a weakness. Corner, last year, Chance Rucker is a true freshman, played 500 snaps. To me, I never saw a freshman moment from him. I'm sure if you looked closely, you'd see some. And I'm sure the previous staff would probably look and say, well, this is a freshman moment, this is a freshman moment. But I don't remember that many out of Chance Rucker last year, expecting him to take up take it up a notch. Who else is out there? Marquis Lowry's played a little bit. Charles Brantley's back. He's played a little bit. Um, there at corner, Dylan Tatum is still around. I don't think that's a weakness. I'm not saying it's a strength. It could it could become a strength as Rucker continues to take on experience. And we still haven't still not sure what Eddie Pleasant, Philip Davis, Sean Brown, those guys could provide. But I'm not seeing like huge glaring weaknesses there. These, these are some players that have been on the field and have functioned. Safety, those guys can function. Mangum and Spencer, solid. Jonathan Kimmick, kicker, solid. Eckley at punter, solid. Plus, I just went over the whole 22. The question is, what's the biggest, most glaring weakness? And I've never really, really like stopped and thought about it from that angle. And I'm not saying they've got strengths across the board, but. I'm not seeing glaring weaknesses right now. Now that can change with injuries and so forth, but it's an interesting question and I don't have a good answer for you. Thanks for bringing me into that. Question two, Jim from Grand Rapids. We'll get to you in a minute. Let's go over here to the comments area. And again, we appreciate everybody checking in with us on a Thursday afternoon. I know it's not, it's not ideal to have a talk show late in the week for a podcast like this. It's better to do them earlier in the week. You'll get more, more involvement because I'm in that Purdue games in a day and a half. And I'm sorry it's four days after the Ohio State game, but it, it's it's such a, a bellwether game. It's such a linchpin game that it still bears talking about four days later. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Not specifically about that game, but what it says about this team. Clark Marier, blown off work. He's in here first today. Appreciate him. YT Sparty says, hey, Jim, go green. Mr. Bone Man says, hello, cop of the Spartan family. YT Spartan says, my, for my own sanity, I will not be watching the Purdue game live. Um, YT Sparty. That is, that's probably a good idea. Self-awareness seems to be a strength for you and do whatever you've got to do. Don't watch it live. Stu Redmond says, hello, everyone. Let's roll. So Clark Marier is running the point. YT Sparty, even though he's, he's going to be a no-show on Saturday, I'm starting him at the two guard. Mr. Bone Man, he's the four man. He's throwing those elbows. Stu Redmond, that's a shooter's name. Stu Redmond's just shooting. I, I got Redmond and, and um, YT Sparty on the wings. And then um, we've got Nick. He's our starting center. So he says, so is she Sheffield confirmed coming? You're asking about TJ Sheffield transfer from Purdue. No, he is not confirmed coming that I've heard, unless you've heard something. I've been away for three or four days. If somebody said something somewhere, but it's my understanding going back to January, I mean, it wasn't going to be happening this spring. Things would have to happen during the summer. Um to get some things squared away. So unless you've heard something the last three days, I'm, well, I'm telling you what I've known from early January and I've not heard anything different since early January. And that is, no, he's not confirmed coming and the situation looks steep. So I uh, never say never, but that's kind of what it's looking like. Mr. Bowman says, Comp, I watched the Izzo press conference. He was getting mad at reporters who kept asking about Booker. Tom looks like the tired old man who yells, get off my lawn. Get off my lawn. Yeah, Izzo has, when it comes to a level of 10 of being bothered by things, whether it's reporters or Jay Billis <laughs> or um, NIL, which he doesn't hate, or the transfer portal, which he does hate, or Twitter, which he hates, or society in general, 
or the universe in general. In terms of a level of 10 of annoyance, he's always walking around at 8. He's always, even if he's smiling, have a good day, all you got to do is that, you know, just say portal and boom, he's up to 11. So there was some of that. What he needed to say about Booker was, hey guys, you guys have been in practice. And this is what he was trying to say, but he was too boiled up. He should have said, you guys, I, I allow you guys to come to practice. And by the way, this is not what he said, but he allows us to watch more practice than most coaches all over the country at the major conference level. Bo Ryan never allowed media to watch practice ever. And I tell you what, I appreciate going to practice. I, I think it's great. I love to watch it and I'm dialed in and I'm watching what they're working on and all those things. I think it's a great privilege. Tom Izzo is one of the greatest coaches to ever wear a whistle in any sport and to have a chance to watch him work and practice. To me, I think it's fascinating. Okay. It's like watching Rembrandt paint. Sorry. Did, is that, is that, is that, uh, is that trivializing Rembrandt too much? I'm sorry. He's I, I'm watching him, and it's I think it's a privilege to be in there. And he's not perfect. Nobody is. He's lost games. He'll tell you he's been out coached before. It happens. Um, but what he should have said when people were asking about Booker, he should have said, "Hey, I let you guys watch practice." And what he could have said is more than most programs in the country. And you saw what Booker was. If you know anything about basketball, you saw him in November, December. Was he ready at that point? Could he have helped us or was he a liability? He could have asked us that. And we, I assume most of us would have said, no, nah, he wasn't quite ready. Okay, so now you understand why it's taken a while for him to get in the lineup. That being said, he, we, can, we also see that he's making progress. And it's been, it's been, it's been nice. It's been impressive. I'm, I'm happy for Booker because he he's heading in the right direction. But that's why he was mad about those type of things. That's how Izzo could have ha handled it a little bit better. Um, but, hey, you know, he's a human being. He's, he gets tired of some of these things. So you're right. And if you haven't seen the video, it's here on the channel. You can watch it. And it was kind of crowded. Conan Dyke was doing the video, and it was a little crowded. So it, it's, you know, usually I get in there with my, with my camera and can get in there a little tighter. But it was a bigger crowd yesterday, and I wasn't there. Paul was there. So... Appreciate that, but you can, you can find that here on the channel. YT Sparty says, the thing about Izzo, the more you push him, the more he sticks to his guns. Might be one way to look at it. But we'll have to wait and see whether it goes into the portal this year and after the season and who's back and all those things. That's still to be determined. I don't close the door on the possibility of him going to the portal for one or two this spring. I've not asked around about that yet, but I think it's a possibility. Some of that depends on whether they bring in Bryson Tucker. That looks like it's Michigan State versus Kansas versus... Indiana versus G League. But now the G League, they're talking about G League Ignite. You know, the general manager or the commissioner of the NBA, Silver, Adam Silver, was saying they're going to revisit G League, G League Ignite. The Ignite team is the team comprised of players who come straight from high school that don't want to play in college. And that's what Tucker's considering. Would he consider overtime elite if G League goes down? I don't know. <clears throat> Um, I don't, I don't, I don't really think they're going to get, they're, they're, they're recruiting Tucker, but I just, I doubt that's going to happen. Just a gut feeling, just an educated gut feeling on that one. YT Spartan says, anyone else in their old age find they have trouble sitting through intense games? Question mark. Uh, now YT Sparty is just journaling now, which I respect. Mr. Bowman said, Tom's starting to act like a stubborn old man at this point. Um, you're entitled to your opinion. I, I I disagree with that. YT Sparty says he's always been stubborn, but it just seems bigger now. Bigger? No. If he's always been stubborn, I mean, he's got his blueprint. He's won 700 games. Defense rebounding. The thing that Izzo's frustrated about is he's having trouble pushing levers and finding the buttons to push on this team. And... He will say there's some societal things there. He's been lamenting about that for several years, that it's harder to find leaders in the phone age, the smartphone age. Players are less likely to be vocal. So Malik Hall, not vocal. Tyson Walker, not vocal. A.J. Hilgard is vocal, but some of it was destructive. They've rewired him to, to be more constructive with his vocal leadership. However, there's other things that are with him are like herding cats. So, 
and he's got a lot of ability, and I, I've got respect for A.J. Hogart as well. And he's trying very hard to balance things out. I thought Hogart played good defense. For the most part, ran the show pretty well Sunday. Made one or two mistakes. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, YD Sparty says, what about Nick Marsh? Great point. i got to add him. I didn't have any freshmen on the depth chart. And you're right. Great point. Nick Marsh, he'll be a freshman. He will get playing time. I'm going to go back into my depth chart. Cheat, cheat. And he is the freshman most likely to get playing time and most likely to be college ready. He'll have uh, he'll have to undergo a process, as they all do. But you're right, I didn't mention him. Type it in him right now because I've not added true freshman to my projected depth chart yet. But great point, Mr. Um, YT Sparty, for finding my error on that, and I appreciate it. Uh, most of Mr. Bone Man from Harper Woods. All right, let's go back over here to the questions in the mailbag. Jim from Grand Rapids says, Hey, Jim, appreciate all you and the Spartan Mag staff do for us, fanatical Spartans. Thank you, Jim and Grand Rapids, for be- being a magger. All right, he says, he says, maybe it's been discussed on the final forum, but what is the path for Izzo and company in the tournament? Assuming a loss... This weekend at Purdue, winning against Northwestern and Indiana are absolute must-wins to my understanding. If that scenario played out, would that punch Michigan State's ticket to the big dance, or would they need at least one Big Ten tournament W as well? Good question. I'm not a bracketologist. You know, I listen to what the the bracket people say and where Michigan State's been, and as of now, they're not one of the four last four out, but if they lose to Purdue, then lose to Northwestern, They might be one of the last four in, so they could easily teeter toward that part of the fence. I've been saying most of the year that 19 wins would get them in based on past tournaments and the current bracketology. Again, I'm not a bracketologist. I think 19 wins. That means two more wins. You beat Northwestern Indiana, you're in. You beat Northwestern, lose to Indiana, you're probably going to need at least one win in the Big Ten tournament to be safe. So... If they beat Northwestern and Indiana, which is going to be difficult, that gets you to 19 and 12 in a regular season. If you go one and done in the Big Ten tournament, you're 19 and 13, but I think you're in. You lose. You beat Northwestern, lose to Indiana, you're 18 and 13. Beating Northwestern is going to be difficult, right? Even without Barry. 18 and 13. You lose your last three. Then what are you? 17 and 14, you're in big trouble. And then you're going to need probably, you're still going to need to get to 19 wins. You're going to need to win two Big Ten tournament games. I think 19 is the feel-safe number. So, you know, and I've heard people say that, and it, I don't, it's an interesting point about those two losses to Indiana. I'm sorry, to Ohio State and Iowa were debilitating losses for sure. But Iowa 17 and 12, 9 and 9, they're on the bubble. They could be an NCAA tournament team. Anytime you lose to an NCAA tournament team, could that ever be considered a terrible loss? It was a, an expensive loss, and the way it came down was unsightly. Ohio State 16 and 12. We we know they've struggled. They fired their coach. They've had a bad year. Such a bad year that they beat Alabama, who's number 14 in the country. They beat Bait, they beat Dayton, who's in the top 20. They beat Santa Clara, who's in the top 20. They beat Purdue, who's number what, two in the country? Ohio State. They're 16 and 12. They beat Alabama, Dayton, Santa Clara, Purdue, and Michigan State. And that's a terrible loss, which it is. But in the random landscape of college basketball, Michigan State played well for 30 minutes. And then they went cold for a lot of reasons. And Ohio State just kind of was able to grind it out. Now, um, Question four, Adam from Grand Rapids. He says, uh, do you still believe this team has a chance to get out of the first weekend if they make the tournament? My answer, yes, they still can. I'm less confident than I was two weeks ago. I thought after they beat Illinois, then they finished the sweep against Michigan. I thought, okay, all right, they're going to go ahead and beat Iowa and Ohio State. They will get to 19-9 and at this juncture. Headed toward a number six seed. If they were 19 and nine right now, won those two games, they'd be like number 21 in the country right now. Not good enough to be there. Didn't happen for them. So I'm not as confident as I was two weeks ago. But I always said it was like herding cats. And I've always said I'm less sure about this team than I was last year. 
Last year, I thought they had Sweet 16 potential, even when they were going through rocky situations like they have this year. But this year, at this point right now, it's more of a rocky situation than anything last year because it's happening later in the year. So I'm less confident. I still think it's possible. Can they rally and deliver what they did last year, which was defeat Marquette in the second round? A very good Marquette team. That I've, As I've said before, that Marquette team was very good. The Prosper kid was a power forward that could guard Joey Hauser and guard mismatch fours to a three and switch onto a two or one. Great defensive player. Became a first-round draft choice. And wasn't really regarded that way midseason, but was great. Marquette was very good. Marquette beat UConn in the Big East Tournament semifinals. They were the last team to beat UConn. And last year, if they would have met up with UConn in the NCAA tournament, they might have beaten them again. Marquette was a team that could have won the national title last year. Michigan State beat them in the second round. Do not discount that as a huge accomplishment to win that game. Is this team capable of beating a team like last year's Marquette? Is this team capable of beating a team like Duke two years ago when Michigan State met Duke in the second round and was up by five with five minutes to go? Probably not. Not unless they get more of their crowd together. Booker gets more in Booker and or Kohler become more settled with their role and can provide some offense at that position. And Aiken shoots well and Walker gets healthy and becomes a 30 point score. Not that you're going to get 30 from him, but the same Tyson Walker that scored 30 against Purdue last year. That guy like Konadak is talking about. You need that guy. Malik all to be at his best. This team at their ceiling best can give a lot of teams a lot of trouble. Not sure it's going to get harnessed. Not sure that's going to get squared away. We've not seen it all come together once this year, maybe in the Baylor game. So, like we said earlier, when George called in, problem is you're getting to the point now where you're going to be a nine seed or something like that. You'd be better off being a 10 seed and playing a number seven in the first round because then in the second round you'll get a two seed. If you're an eight or a nine and you play a number one seed in the second round, you're not playing Purdue because you're in the same conference. So you're going to get UConn or Houston most likely in the second round. The other, who are the number four? Who are the number one seeds? Going to be Purdue, UConn, Houston, and the fourth one is probably going to be either Arizona or Tennessee. Michigan State's already played them. Those teams have been a little bit up and down. Tennessee was without some players when they played Michigan State, but Tennessee's pretty good. Tennessee has a history with this group of kind of choking in the tournament and shooting poorly, but but connect the transfer um, alleviates a lot of that. Last night they played Auburn, and I think he scored, what, 21 points in the last 12 minutes? NBA player. I mean, that guy's an NBA player. Excellent. Off the dribble, athletic, medium range, long range. He's an, he's an NBA 15-point-per-game guy in the future, I think. Maybe more. So Tennessee's going to be... Yeah, I, Tennessee could be a number one seed. You might get them in the second round. Can they beat a Tennessee right now? That That's hard to, to imagine. You get... Kansas, I mean, Kansas has had trouble with McCullough being injured. If Kansas is a two seed, you get them in the second round. On a good night, Michigan State could beat them. Uh, maybe two times out of ten. Maybe three times out of ten. Maybe four times out of ten if Aikens and if, if Walker's healthy and Aikens is, is shooting well and they get a little bit and Hall does his thing. Yeah, that can happen. First, you got to get in the tournament. And you have to get two wins to get into the tournament. That's That's not going to be... That's, that's that's still some work to do there. All right. Question five. JMO from Milwaukee. He says, on a scale of, where, of one to ten, where do you think Izzo's confidence is that, one, this team makes the tournament, and two, that this team has a chance to make some noise in the tournament, and three, how do you think he would assess his coaching this year? All right, one, that this team makes a tournament. Izzo's confident he thinks it's going to happen, but you can tell after the Ohio State game, he was a little bit, I don't know if shaken is the right word, I don't know if at a loss is the right phrase. Disturbed, maybe. And it was it was an Izzo. Konadike said that he's seen him like that before. I'm not so sure. It was a different level of Izzo than I've seen. And I was not in the room for that. So I didn't quite get the whole vibe. But watching it on film, his post-game press conference, you could tell he was disturbed and not angry disturbed. Like, we're going to get after him practice, which is usually his default. But like, holy crap. I thought this team, you know, was coming together. I thought it was putting their, pushing the right buttons. But it's just not happening. 
And then Walker's not making shots, and Aiken's not making shots. Now, Walker made a couple of real nice acrobatic finishes on driving layups. But the open shots that they were creating for them, you know, weren't going down. And as a coach, you assemble a team, you drill them, and then you you have X's and O's, and you put together game plans, and you run plays to get good shots. And they got pretty good shots. That's all a coach can do. But if Walker's not healthy, if he's 80% of what he is, and I see it with him, his ability to create his own shot is reduced. Moving without the ball has been watered down. Like we talked about earlier in the show, away from the ball that they they kind of ran a down screen for him and he didn't really set it up as great as he normally does. Ohio State, which did a good job, scouting report wise, getting out on the, the down screen pop out, took that away and then... Hall had to try to make something up at the shot clock. Spin dribble got it stolen. That was Michigan State's third to last possession of the game. The second part of that, what do I think Izzo thinks, uh, Izzo's confidence that this team has a chance to make some noise in the tournament? I think Izzo still believes that. He's a perpet- He's a continual optimist, and he thinks that if this team... Gets all the crap together in 31 games. Which they haven't done yet this year. But he will, he'll ride with his guys and himself and his staff if they can win a first round game against Florida or South Carolina or something like that. Then in the second round, if they meet up with Arizona, Izzo's going to believe that they're, they're going to have a path to, to make it happen. I don't think the chances of that are are great. Less than I thought two weeks ago. But you're asking about Izzo's confidence. Izzo's still confident that they can do that. And how do I think he would assess his coaching this year? Izzo's hard on himself that uh, in some ways. I think he was upset with his coaching and his staff's coaching and himself with the Iowa game, with preparing for some of the downscreen curls to Sanford and some of those actions. I think that if they looked at their video of the last six or seven minutes of the Iowa game... And some of the sets that Michigan State ran late, because late in games, at this time of year, Michigan State will run unscouted looks, new plays. And the new plays they ran late in that game um, didn't execute real well. Partly Walker not moving as well, partly just the structure of some things um, just just didn't click off real well. And I think that he would probably grade himself and his staff not so great with those two games. They've lost four games since January 13th, I think it is. So the overall record, not great. and They're running out of chips. They've lost four games since January 13th. These two games against Iowa and Ohio State have been debilitating. Right? Just All right, so Iowa game 7 out of 14 from the free throw line. You should be able to overcome that, but in this league against an Iowa team that was desperate, could be an NCAA tournament Iowa team. Free throws will bother you, right? Those four losses. One of them was the loss to Minnesota, 7 out of 17 from the line. Had a lead, let it get away. Ohio State game, double-digit lead. A Booker shooting a three-pointer to go up 15 with about 15 minutes to go. If that goes in, you're up 15. Everything's different. The season's different. You're one step closer to being in the tournament. Everything's great. Misses that shot. I'm not blaming it on him, but that's how close Michigan State was to going up 15 with, I think, 16 minutes to go. So they did some things well in that game, but you got to finish. And ironically, I wrote an article, which we call the dot comp series, after the Michigan game, and I was giving Michigan State credit for harnessing an ability to finish, finishing a sweep of Michigan coming back from a deficit to finish Michigan, finishing another trek toward the NCAA tournament. All those things are not aging well because since then they've not been able to finish anything. So I'm a little confounded by it. Izzo's disturbed by it. You're asking how uh, uh, his confidence level, I think his confidence in some ways is shaken in terms of his confidence and his ability to get this team to, um, to uh, to push the buttons to get them to produce. He's like, you know, he's disturbed by these things. All right, so 
let's go. Let's let's talk a little bit about this game and the, the the juncture that I thought was was could have been done differently if they had to do over again. Um, that came. You know, if you talk about Booker, and this this is part of the of, of the point, is whether or not Booker should have played. If you just look at the rotations. All right, first half, they started Booker and Hall, and they went uh, what six six minutes. Then they both have to sit. They both they they played six minutes. Then you come in with the two bigs, Sissoko and Cooper. They played about a minute fifty nine seconds. And everybody wants to complain about the two bigs, why are they playing together at the two big lineup. They played for two minutes in the first half. They didn't lose the game in those two minutes. Then they went Hall and Kohler. Then they went Hall and Booker. Came in with about six minutes to go in the half. Then Booker finished the half. Booker and Sissoko with five minutes to go in the first half. Booker and Kohler with two minutes to go in the first half. And then Booker and Hall to the end of the half. So Booker played a lot of the last, last few minutes of the first half. Second half, Booker and Hall start again. And... With about 50 minutes to go, Booker made a little error, and I realize you shouldn't come out for just one error, but it might have led to more problems. Now, he missed the three-pointer. There was 18 minutes to go, which could have cut it to 15. They had a real nice play on that alley-oop dunk and was follow, fouled on it. Michigan State goes up 12. He misses the free throw. Uh, playing well. and he's, he's aware, and he's moving well, and he's getting confidence, doing some good things. Hands are good. Ability to finish, good. And that's going to make him dynamic in the future. Michigan State was up by 10, 38-28. Ohio State runs a double drag, and Michigan State had been jamming the double drag. And on this case, they jammed the double drag, and Walker chose to go to the wrong side of it and kind of got hung out. Gale drives, scores, cuts it to 38, 30, 15, 30 to go. I'm not sure that's Walker's error or Booker's, but that was one of the last, that was the last time Booker was in the game, basically. And they would have put him in more ball screens. And he was doing okay with it. It wasn't a huge error. But in terms of being able to rely on a player to do things in concert with the guards, they're not totally there yet. I think it's coming. But I can kind of see why that caused a little bit of uh, hesitation as to who they were going to go with down the stretch. All right, so he goes out. This is where the problem came in. Let me let me find it for sure here. All right, at that moment, right, he goes out. Then it's Sissoko and Hall. They go, they play together. Fifteen minutes to go. It's forty to thirty one. Then with twelve minutes to go in the game, Sissoko sits. Cooper comes in with Kohler. So Hall sits for the first time in the second half. He's got to sit. So at that point, they go Cooper and Kohler. Twelve minutes to go in the game. Some people would look at that and say that that was going with two bigs, and technically it is. It's the first time that Kohler that I can think of that he played the power forward position. You're up 10, 12 minutes to go. Tough time to be experimenting, but you're also developing. And maybe you think you're going to win the game anyway up 10. I know Izzo never gets that comfortable with things, but that was the time right there. This is where they got hung out to dry a little bit. These guys are on the court with Cohen Carr, with Walker and Holloman. So it's Cohen Carr, Cooper, and Kohler. So it's two bigs with Cohen Carr out there also. And they were in the game, and Ohio State's starting to come back, and there was no whistle, and Michigan State could not get a whistle. And you had, I'm sorry, Hogard, Aikens, and Hall were waiting to check in. You had Holloman out there with them. Holloman is the point guard with Walker. So Walker is the one steady guy out there. He's out there with Holloman, Cohen Carr, Cooper, and Kohler. I'm not sure how many time how many how much that five that quintet. I'm not sure how much they've played together all season. This is probably the first time all year that those five have been on the court, and they're on the court 12 10 to go, and it's 46 36. Ohio State cuts it to eight. They cut it to six. Four and a half minutes they're on the court and they can't get a whistle. Waiting to check in. Hogard, Aikens, Hall waiting to check in. They're at the scorers table waiting. T- 12 minutes to go. 10 minutes to go. In retrospect, Izzo doesn't want us to coach his team. But in retrospect, Izzo doesn't like to waste timeouts. He's got three timeouts left. In retrospect, 10 minutes to go. Hindsight being 2020, I call timeout. <laughs> now that we know how everything turned out. Call timeout. 
Get Kohler and Cooper off the court. Maybe right there you, you give Booker a couple minutes to see what he's got with 10 minutes to go. Instead, they're on the court, on the court, on the court. All the way, I think, until the 742 mark. They're on the court from 1210 to 742. Kohler's playing defense on, what's his name, number 21, the freshman that Michigan State recruited. The guy hits a follow away jumper. First time Kohler's played defense on a four. Holloman makes some mistakes right there more so than the last five minutes. I think from the 12-minute mark to the 7-minute mark. And by the time those guys check back in, Sissoko checks. And now there's seven minutes to go. Ohio State's got momentum. It's a six-point game, 52-46. At that point, 7.42 to go. You're up six. 7.42 to go. At that point, do I put Booker back on the court? No, I go with Sissoko. They went with Sissoko, and Sissoko was solid the last seven minutes. The other guys didn't produce didn't do what they're supposed to do Sissoko did his job I got no problem with Sissoko going in with seven minutes to go and finishing the game if I were to second guess anything I would second guess the 12 minute mark to the seven minute mark when Kohler and Cooper were stuck on the court and those were two bigs so I understand that that part of it so kind of got hung out on the court couldn't get a whistle to stop play to get the subs in didn't call time out at that point debatable I would I would say that all right so while they're on the court, 10 minutes to go, let's let's take a closer look. And I tried to get this video together, but didn't get it together in time. But bear with me if you find this interesting. 10 minutes to go, Michigan State's up, up by about 6 or 8 or whatever. And from that point forward, Michigan State is 3 out of 12 from the field with 4 turnovers. So I think that's about 16 possessions. Fifteen possessions, maybe sixteen. Three of twelve with four turnovers. All right, starts off Jackson Kohler in the post. Hook misses it. Next time, next trip, Tyson Walker. See, it's the guards. When Izzo was talking about this after practice yesterday, the guards he felt he didn't come out and say lost the game, but that's what he was more more focused on in terms of where the game got away. Not so much that Sissoko was on the court and they didn't get enough out of the center position, and the Booker might have been able to save the day. It was the guards who didn't quite do their job, like Conerdike said, who didn't do their job. Tyson Walker, very good player, but one of the four turnovers came in the next possession, 9.51 to go. Entry pass, Tyson Walker trying to get it down low to Jackson Kohler, intercepted. Turnover. Michigan State wasn't really destroyed by turnovers, but four here in the last 10 minutes hurt. Next possession, Trey Holloman playing the point guard. Hogard is on the bench getting a rest. Holloman. You know, he was really good in December and parts of January. He's been more erratic lately and had a had a tough, had, you know, had a tough stretch right here. Kohler and Cooper on the court. Everybody's looking at that. But Holloman was the guy that kind of wasn't up to his usual what he's been. He's been a plus in a lot of games off the bench. Struggled right here to, at a key time. But in this situation, shot clock's down and he makes a 16-footer, bails him out, gives him an eight-point lead with nine minutes to go. There's nine minutes to go. You got an eight-point game. Prior to that, of course, it was a six-point game. Six-point game, nine minutes to go. You got Holloman out there running the point. And Kohler and Cooper and Carr. They got they got caught with a with a with a difficult rotation there. And part of that is, you know, is those big on rotation, who starts and who comes in next. And those are things they usually try to map out and iron out in December. And you'll hear him talk about that early in the year. Not something he wants to iron out in late February. And if you have Booker starting the first half and Booker starting the second half, that changes the rotations afterwards. And that's how that's part of the reason that you end up with Kohler, Cooper, and Carr together out there with Holloman, I think for the first time ever, for five long, excruciating minutes. Didn't call timeout. I know, I know he, he likes to save his timeouts because he's he wants them at the end, and I understand that. This might have been a situation where if he had to do it over again, he, he probably would get them off the court. So Trey hits that 16-footer in a shot clock situation because nothing else worked in that particular possession. They go up by eight with nine minutes to go. Things are seeming, seeming a little bit better. I'm just focusing on Michigan State's offense for the most part right here, not talking about what was going on on defense, even though defense is half the game. But it was the offense that went cold here, three out of 12 of the four turnovers in the last 16 possessions. Next possession, Trey Holloman takes a bad shot with 20 seconds left on the shot clock. The announcer... Calls it a heat check. Kind of was. You don't need Trey Holloman doing a heat check. It's like a 16-footer off the dribble. Difficult shot. 
8.36 to go. 20 seconds on the shot clock. 8.36 to go. I don't know if Michigan State was up 8 or up 6 at that time, but not a good decision. Next possession, Holloman gets it in transition, throws it away, turnover with 8 minutes to go. You might remember when Michigan State finally got to the to a whistle stoppage with 7.42 left. If you watched it, you could read Izzo's lips. If you're watching the telecast, Izzo looks at Holloman and says, Trey, you're out. He didn't like that shot selection, didn't like that turnover. And when Izzo says it was the guards that kind of malfunctioned as he looks back on it, that kind of failed to finish this game, those are some of the plays. Tyson Walker, entry pass turnover. Trey Holloman, bad shot. Trey Holloman, interception. Then they get the other guys checked in, and they run a play. Actually, these guys were still in. Tyson Walker misses an open three-pointer. This was like... uh, and then, you know, Cohen Carr is fouled getting the offensive rebound, going after it hard for an offensive rebound. Then then Walker, dribble handoff, misses a 12-footer. What, what I forgot here is why, if there was a foul there, that should have been the whistle that uh, got everybody out of the game. But anyway, Tyson Walker drives off a dribble handoff, misses a 12-footer. So Tyson Walker on that trip misses an open three-pointer and then kind of a tough 12-footer. Tyson Walker, next possession. This is after this is seven thirteen left. Got the whistle. Got everybody. The lineup changed. Got the starters in now. Well, not the starters. Got Sissoko and the other four starters. They run a good play. They get Tyson Walker wide open. Uh, actually, in transition, they're up by six fifty two forty six seven thirteen to go. Transition. Tyson Walker wide open right corner three pointer misses it. If he makes that, they're up nine with seven minutes to go. Doesn't guarantee a victory, but these are the the little cuts by death by a thousand, thousand cuts from the guard position. Next possession, shot clock running down. Tyson Walker gets a pretty decent look. Three-pointer misses it with 6-12 to go. Going cold. Now they've lost well, one, two, three, four, five. They've missed five straight shots plus a turnover. Next possession. Okay, after uh, the, th- the three-pointer, let's go back to 7-13. And if this is boring you, I'm, I apologize, but we're talking some serious basketball. It's late February. Michigan State fans, are they're, they're, it's basketball season. It's, it's leap day. It should be March 1st. There's some anxiety. People want to talk basketball. I mapped out a few things. If this isn't your thing, that's fine. But if it is, we're just kind of looking to categorize the problems here. Walker misses that three-pointer in the corner. Fast break, seven minutes to go, six-point game. At the other end, Ohio State gets a three-point play that cuts it a three. It's kind of a fluky play. That, in my opinion, looking at it, was the turning point of the game. That situation, Michigan State played good defense. I can't remember who missed it. It might have been Gale or Bonner. And the defense was so good by Aikens. Might have even gotten a piece of it. A little four, maybe 15, 16-footer. Misses it. Barely grazes the rim. And Malik Hall's playing defense on Zed Key, who's a big body, strong guy. And Malik Hall is getting position and and manages to push key under the rim, which is where you want the guy to get so you can get the rebound or just erase him. But the defense by Aikens was so good that the ball is almost an air ball, just barely grazes the front of the rim, and it lands in Key's hands. He's not in a position to get a rebound, but he gets the rebound. He's not in a position to get a rebound because Hall did a good job of putting him under the rim. But the defense was so good that it was an air ball, basically. Key gets it, goes up, scores, and they call a phantom foul. Wasn't a foul. I don't think the officials cost Michigan State by any chance, by any stretch, but it's kind of a fluky rebound, three-point play, foul, makes a free throw, three-point play, cuts it to three, turning point of the game. Unfortunately, in this sport, Michigan State was hurt by good defense and good rebounding position. And a bad call, and they get three points, and it's a three-point game with like 6.55 to go. The game changes right there. Good defense, good rebounding position. They get a bounce. The guy finishes. So, I mean, there have been plenty of times when Michigan State's big men have not been able to finish. To his credit, Zed Key, who's a solid big man, a solid wide body, six foot nine big man, finishes. And they've got some talent. Ohio State have had a bad season. But like I said, they beat Purdue, they beat Alabama, they beat Santa Clara, they beat Dayton. Go find them in the top 25 right now. Top 20, all those teams, top 20. So Zed Key finishes that one. So now Michigan State's up three. Tyson Walker, shot clock down, de- decent look, three-pointer misses with 6-12 to go. 
Now it's a three point game. It's a three point or one point game. Five thirty nine left, and Michigan State Malik Hall scores on a spinning ten footer. Michigan State runs some zoom action, dribble handoff, and they get it back to Hall on a screen roll replace, and he goes to work and makes a nice tough shot. Five thirty nine to go. Nice go to play on the back side of uh, you know on a second option type of thing. So Hall gets that one. And uh, that's their second to last field goal of the game. 539 left. Next play, turnover. A.J. Hogard with a blind entry pass. You know, Hogard played pretty well, but right now, you know, for him to, to make this to make this mistake with 443 left, there there was uh, Michigan State was uh, up 54-51. Bonner had just driven and missed against Walker. Walker gets the rebound. Michigan State runs a runs a new play. They're into their new plays at the end of the end of the game, and they didn't quite execute these that well. This was not their greatest late game script of plays. Michigan State runs uh, kind of a double stack back cut for Aikens, and Michigan State covered it. Or Ohio State covered it pretty well. Sissoko throws the back cut to, to Aikens, and Aikens decides not to go in. Probably a good decision. Akparo was there to, to protect the rim, brings it back out. But if you look at that play, when they run that double stack and a back cut for Aikens, on the other side, Tyson Walker was getting set up for a screen, the screener. Um, but that play, I'm not sure if it would have been wide open or not. Because like we said, Walker's not moving that great without the ball as, usually, as well as he usually does. But because you throw the back cut to Aikens, which is one of the first options, it doesn't result in a shot, but also it takes away the screen, the screener action to Walker. That play never runs its course because they tried this. Now they get it back out top. They try to set something up. And Hogard does a spin and like throws an entry past to Malik Hall trying to post up. And it's like a blind. He did, he did a blind. He, like, he did a spin dribble and just throws it in before he even looks. Gets knocked away. Um, turnover, and uh, they didn't score. Thornton missed a three, and Hall got the rebound. But still, it's 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 one of these empty possessions. And Hogard had played a solid game, but you know why are you making that blind pass right there with four minutes to go? Easy for me to say, I wasn't even there, you know. But you, as I proverbially say, it's easy for me to say while I'm drinking coffee and eating a donut and getting fat. And I've always been a terrible basketball player. It's easy for me to criticize. A.J. Hogard, who, like I said, is better at basketball than I'll ever be at anything. So much respect to him. But he makes that mistake at that moment. These are the things that death by a thousand cuts. Harnessing cats. Four minutes to go. One of four turnovers in the last ten minutes. I've not seen Hogard attempt a pass like that. A blind entry pass. In his career. He does it here. Earlier, you know, like the, the, new, the new play earlier in that possession... The back cut to Aikens, not there. Get it back out. Would the screener, screen to screener have worked with Walker? We'll never know. But it, these are not centers blowing it for Michigan State. These are guard situations, guard decisions. Next, next possession. Aikens, fast break. Goes up for a dunk, blocked by Akpara. Not a bad decision. Aikens goes up for a big play. And I can't remember what, what created the fast break, but rebound and go. Defense for Michigan State still doing pretty well because Michigan State's not scoring, and it's remaining a 6-4, three-point game. Transition, Aikens goes up for a dunk, which would have been a great play. Akpara, I mean, it would have been a great momentum play. Score is Michigan State's up by three at that point. Dunk gets blocked. I don't know if I've ever seen Aikens get a dunk blocked. Credit to Akpara. Loose ball, Sissoko dives for it like Michigan State is trained to do. Loose ball, dive. Your other friends will come and get it, but they are not going to get it and go because you're going to dive and recover the fumble. So Soko dives like a good soldier, kind of undercuts the guy, gets called for a foul. Izzo was curious about it, the crowd boos, but you got to call that foul. I mean, it's, 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 it would have been illegal in football. It would have been clipping. So he dives for it. Credit Ohio State. They block the dunk. Loose ball, foul. So that's one of the one of the four one of the three for twelve. One of the nine missed shots is a blocked dunk. Can't can't fault the effort. Aikens going up hard for it. Next possession, shot clock. Aikens misses a three pointer. Not his fault. Had a des- desperation attempt. Three eleven to go. At this point, Michigan State is still up by three. After a timeout, Michigan State calls a timeout. Those timeouts that Michigan State have been saving. 
come out and run a horns. The horns ball screen didn't produce much. Walker drives, gets knocked out of bounds. While he's driving, his arm gets hooked by Thornton, and that's when Walker gave the official like a really dirty look, like he hooked my arm. So there's only three seconds left on the shot clock, and they um, Michigan State runs a baseline inbound play. Ohio State defended it well. It was going to Walker for a baseline like he's been doing all year. Ohio State Ohio State did a good job being into Michigan State's playbook for this game. They, they scouted Hall well on that steal, on that spin dribble. They scouted Walker well on this baseline inbound play. They scouted Walker well on that, that pin down when they when – they, um, when I, I said Walker wasn't moving that well without the ball, Ohio State did a good job. They had something to do with this. You can see when opponents are well scouted into Michigan State's uh, tendencies and some of their playbooks, playbook plays like like the baseline play here. Defended it well, came out to Sissoko, gave it to Akins. One second left of the shot clock, three pointer missed it. Problem there earlier in the drive was uh, the 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 horns ball screen stuff didn't didn't produce much. That's another. Michigan State's late game script in this game didn't produce like we've seen it produce in other games, like it did late in the Illinois game and some others, like it did late in the Michigan game and some others. When they go to a new play, you haven't seen much, or it's a play that they've shown with different window dressing with a different tangent off of it. It's what Izzo does usually really well from about Valentine's Day on. They don't do late script. When I've not, I've never asked him about this, but they've got some late script games, late script plays that you know you can only have so many plays in your playbook. And when you're getting ready for an opponent, maybe you've got five or six new plays. You can't put in 50 new plays for one opponent, maybe five or six, and you save them for late. The plays they save for this game, um, if you watch the game, you can see on the sideline, you get an idea who had the scout for this game because it, it revolves around. And this one, they, they, didn't, they didn't go very well. So it's a combination of guards not playing well and some late game script not doing so great. Partly maybe because you miss a couple shots, maybe some decisions, the whole guard thing, the Walker thing earlier with 10 minutes to go. A lot of reasons. All right, so that was the Aikens desperation one. Then the next play, Michigan State with the turnover. This time, two minutes to go. Still a three-point game. Michigan State with some new stuff. I talked about this with Konadike earlier. It's kind of like a mover blocker thing. Virginia style for a moment ends up with a shuffle cut. And that was setting up a pin down screen. Sissoko pin down screen for Walker. That was the play that Ohio State was overplaying the pin down screen. That was the play where Walker didn't look like he's moving like Tyson Walker normally does away from the ball. And they, they, they overplayed the pin down knowing there was going to be a pin down for a pop out. So could you have done a tangent counter off of that? Maybe if you knew it was coming. I don't know, but Ohio State did a good job identifying it, overplaying Walker, making sure Walker wasn't the guy that was going to beat that beat them on a catch and shoot in that situation. Wasn't moving all that well. Walker catches it, but the defense is on him. Get it back over to the weak side to Hall. Now there's five seconds left on the shot clock. He goes to work. Uh, I think he tried like a crossover spin dribble. Ohio State helper stole it. Again, Ohio State, good job. Scott and report. Individual player, Hall, off the dribble. He likes to go sometimes with a spin move. First time I've seen an opponent be ready for that spin move. Knocked it away. Turnover with 2.13 left. Michigan State up by three. So that's a combination of all of it. Good defense by Ohio State. Walker not moving real well. The scripted plays at the end not producing a good shot there. Hall trying to bail it out. And again, their defense, kind of report-wise, plus for Ohio State. And I'll go back and reiterate, reiterate, reiterate again. Ohio State's had their problems, fired their coach, bad season, but this is still a team that beat Alabama, Purdue, Santa Clara, Dayton. You might think Santa Clara and Dayton aren't good. Go check the top 25. All right, next possession. Walker wide open with 157 left. Missed it a little... Um, but, all right, so that was uh, this one. Ohio State aired a little bit. Michigan State ran a flat screen, pinned down screen by Hall. They followed up a switch. So Walker's open, the right wing missed it. But now Michigan State's up by one at this point, but Michigan State got the offensive rebound, kept alive by Aikens, tipping it back out, gets it back out. Second chance. Walker with an acrobatic, you know, layup. 
making it up. Michigan State was trying to do the flat screen Spain action like they did like late in the Iowa game that worked, but this time there's no one up there for Walker to set a back screen on because they're sagging off Sissoko, like my friend Chris Solari was saying in the in the press conference yesterday, talking about the sagging going on there, and it's, the Spain actually didn't work for those reasons, and Chris was right about that. So Waller sets, uh, Walker sets an air pick because there's nobody there. Pick and pop, get it back to him, drive, lefty finish, 136 to go, Michigan State's up by three. Walker pulled that one out of his rear. Credit to him, great play going to the rim. Drive acrobatic acrobatic layup. I'm critical of the guards like Izzo was. Holloman from that stretch earlier. Hogard with a blind pass. But these guys also made some good plays along the way. A lot of them. That's why they were up by 12 at one point. Almost 15. Akins missed the dunk. Not his fault. Um, missed some shots. Whatever. But here, Akins goes hard. Keeps an offensive rebound alive for a second chance point. Walker, great drive and finish. So Walker... Not a great day for Walker and Aikens percentage-wise, but on that possession, with 136 left, they both came up big. Michigan State goes up three, 56-53 with 136 left. Walker finishing with the offhand on that one. Things look good. Then at the other end, that's when Ohio State ran a nice play, that sh- side ball screen short roll, and Sissoko cuts off the, 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 the ball screen, and then the short roll, then you rotate, then the extra pass down low. And Royal, who was Hall's man, gets the extra pass, cut it to 55 54 with 111 left. Ohio State executing better than Michigan State. Side ball screen, short roll. Sissoko, ball screen, good defense. It's just you do this, they do that, you do this, they do that, you do this, they score. It's just tic tac toe. They, they did a good job with it. So Michigan State gets it back. They run horns, rescreen into a floppy. So Michigan State likes to run floppy action. This time they just did some window dressing at the beginning so that Ohio State couldn't see it coming. So they disguised it a little bit, still got into floppy. Walker's coming off a curl open, and he drives, dishes to Sissoko, but Walker's, they, they, Walker draws the foul. Sissoko catches it and was about to go up, but Akpara was at the whistle had, had sounded. But I'm wondering if they don't call the foul. Sometimes... The foul bails out the defense because you've got to step on them. You've outmaneuvered them, but then there's a foul. That's why I think basketball should adopt. Years from now, maybe they'll do this. But for 20 years, I've been thinking Michigan or that the basketball should adopt the soccer play on rule. That if there's a foul, referee raises his arm. And if you score, there's no foul. He's continued to play. But too often, you'll outmaneuver guys going to the rim and they, you, you blow the play dead. Foul on you. It's like, damn, I just beat the guy. We're going to get two points. I'd rather have two points than the foul. Play on. That soccer rule would, would, would benefit basketball here. I thought Michigan State ran a decent play off this floppy action. Walker going to the hole, drive, draw, dish to Sissoko. They call a foul. No free throw because there's no bonus yet. Now, Sissoko, if you play on there, does he go up or does Akpara block him at the rim? Does he miss? Sissoko, he probably misses. I don't know. The first time I saw it, I'm like, man, that they just outmaneuvered them, had a shot there, and the whistle blew, but I'm not so sure. That's an area where in the future, if Booker catches that, Booker's got a better chance to finish that than Sissoko. I think most of us agree with that. And I think that time is coming, maybe this season. So Sissoko gets the offensive rebound. This was actually the foul called 53 seconds left. Now the shot clock, um, second chance on it. They run a ball screen, Hogard drive. Here, this way, we, I talked about this with, with Kona Dyke a minute ago. Now you get down, this, this play ends with 38 seconds left and Michigan State's up one. But Michigan State has a play. They run ball screen with Hogard. On the, on the weak side, they've got A, a pin down for Akins. They're going to Akins now for a catch and shoot with about 40 seconds to go. And Hall comes out and sets a ghost screen for Hogard. And I can't show you the video here because there's, it's copyright reasons and it depends on whether your site monetizes and all that. I don't want to get into that. And I would have done it if I had more time, but it was too close. We had to get the show going. So Hall comes and instead of setting a ball screen, he sets a ghost screen. Like he's going to set the ball screen, but then he, he leaves and sets a pin down for Akins, which is what they used to do with Joey Hauser a lot. So ghost screen, pin down. But during that ghost screen, Ohio State switches. And now Mahaffey, six foot six power forward, who had been guarding Hall, I think this is after a timeout. So now they switch, and Hogard's being guarded by a power forward. It's a smaller, muscular power forward at 6'6". But rather than waiting for the down screen and go to Aikens for the catch-and-shoot curl, Hogard, executive decision, probably from the bench, 
They probably said, if you, if, the, if you get the Switch, AJ, you go ahead and take them and let's crash the boards. I'm guessing, because that's what they did. Got the Switch. Must have been the, the matchup they, that they wanted. Hogard drives against Mahaffey. They're four-man after the Switch. Hogard gets in there and kind of misses the glasser. Sissoko's in there. He gets the offensive rebound. 38 seconds left. You're up by one. If you can slow it down and play a video game, Sissoko's got it in there down deep. Knowing what we know now, in hindsight being 2020, I would love for Sissoko to get that offensive rebound, pump fake, dribble it out, and let Michigan State reset up one, 38 seconds left. Instead, bless his heart, he got the rebound, goes up, tries to go up strong, gets stripped of the ball. The game changes. We don't know what would happen if Hogard, you know, bless his heart, he's trying to make a play against the, 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 the switch. We don't know whether they told him after the game, man, you know, yeah, the switch was good. Let's go to Aikens on that pin down. Or if they told him, hey, you get the switch, you go. We don't know. We'll never know. They chose A. There's no guarantee that B would have worked. Unknown's undefeated. The shell game of basketball. It all amounts to another empty possession and one of the three of 12 and one of the... Actually, with that strip, that's a, that's a turnover. That's, that's, uh, that's five turnovers in the last 10 minutes. I didn't mark that as a turnover. So five in the last 10 minutes, three out of 12 from the field, five turnovers, and that's one of them. Sissoko getting off at the rebound and getting stripped. Tough way to lose. I mean, there's effort going on there. It's hard to be mad at anybody. It's just fine-tuning. But that's how that, that possession ended up being empty, and then they get the ball, and uh, they miss, and then there's a foul, and, you know, they they – Hit two, hit, hit two free throws, and Michigan State's down one. Walker drives. They call a foul. Favorable call. I don't think Walker was fouled there. Makes one of two free throws. Tie game, and then they hit the game winner. But I know that was probably painful for a lot of people, but we do it here for an exercise to just to really categorize what was going right and what was going wrong. And not many times in there are you going to see that Sissoko was a big problem or that anything that Booker might have done that might have been differently, maybe he'll space it out a little bit. I don't know if the defense would chase him. Chances are, and I, I think I think Sissoko did a good job of defensive rebounding for the most part down the stretch of the last seven minutes. That's why they put him in there and left him in there. If he had failed, they would have taken him out. The problem, the, the, the more um, debatable thing, was that five-minute stretch earlier when Cooper and Cole were on there, and they were on there for five minutes with Carr, with Holloman, and they couldn't get a whistle. The lead went from 10 to 6. Booker in that in that moment, I don't disagree with people out there that are being critical, saying, you know, I'd like to see Booker again. I don't disagree. Might have might have worked, might not have worked. We don't know. But the last seven minutes, they went with Sissoko, and I think that they that um I think Sissoko was solid, but it was the guard play, um, the 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 um inefficient execution that hurt Michigan State. And I'm not um I thought the effort was good for the guards you know it wasn't effort was shaky at times here and there the loss at minnesota and the loss at northwestern that wasn't the case here and iowa game we talked about it and i thought it was late season dog days judd heathcote thing that wasn't the case here at michigan state effort was good just kind of do you want to say snake bit is that does that count probably not walker not quite himself Hogard making a decision there. Holloman a couple decisions. And um, just not good enough to, to beat a team that is 16 and 12. That if it considered a bad loss, there's a lot of teams in the Big Ten that will beat you if you're not efficient and not finishing. So that was a long study, but it's serious basketball season. So I got into some serious basketball. If that's too long-winded, I apologize. But these are the things that interest me. And if I was thinking maybe it might interest you also, but I wanted to look also at uh, Booker and exactly when he went in and when he came out. He came out with 15, 15 minutes to go. They went with Sissoko and Hall, and then three minutes later with 12 minutes to go, that's when they went with Cooper and Kohler, and that took them all the way to the 740 mark. I would not have put Booker in at the 740 mark in a tight game there. Um, I can't prove that it would have been better or worse, but I don't fault that decision. The 12 minute to the 7 minute mark, Hindsight being 2020, a timeout with 10 minutes to go, switch people up then, might have worked out better. Don't know for sure. Unknown's undefeated. But if I were running it and I had a chance to do it over again, that's probably what I'd do at 10 minutes to go. Of course, that's easy to say. 
you could change a lot of Super Bowls and a lot of playoff games and a lot of World Series games if you had a chance to, to do do-overs. Doesn't mean it was the wrong decision at the time, but I can kind of understand it. But again, when you have Kohler and Cooper in there with Carr and Holloman, a group that I don't think has played together all season, why is Cooper and Kohler, Kohler and Cooper together? Partly because you started the half with Booker. And when you do that, there's a domino effect of the, the um, playing group substitution pattern that sometimes ends up with something funky. You start with something funky, and you get into a something funky later, and it, uh, it hurt Michigan State in that game. Very expensive loss, no question about it. All right, question six, Sherlock from Sterling Heights. Um, asks, how about basketball recruits coming in? Who are you looking forward to seeing play for the Spartans and who can help us the most next year? Well, I mean, it's freshman. It's Kurt Tang, six foot four, silky shooter. I got to see some more video of him this winter to see how he's come along. Number 47 player in the country from Bradford Christian Academy in New Hampshire. He'll help going forward. Instant impact. I'll reserve judgment on that. Jace Richardson, combo skills, six two one seventy five. He's got some strength. I think he has some physical um maturity to him that's going to I think translate well early in his career I think he's got combo skills he plays the two mostly at his team because the boozer guy runs the point but when Jace runs the point I think he has good passing skills I think he's got really good feel for the game as a passer good shooter good um athlete not as great an athlete as Jason was but Jace is good at 6'2 175 he's good Jess McCullough 6'9 out of Cleveland Lutheran East um I think he's going to take a little bit more time. Conan Dyke's high on him with his skills. I've not seen McCullough play in a while, so you're asking me about something I've not gone back and revisited in a while. I thought McCullough, when Michigan State was recruiting him last summer or last winter, I thought he had a ways to go, but I think he's made some progress there. So anyway, give us a like if you're if you're liking our podcast. Also subscribe to the channel if you get a chance. <clears throat> I think that's all the questions we have in the mailbag. Let me go here to the comments area, and we will wrap it up. Uh, J.J. McKay says, looks like there's a conversation about Hogard. Jason G. talks about football. He says, hey, Comp, what's the biggest position group you see heading to the transfer portal after the spring game? Um, I, You know, I'm just, just an educated guess, but I wouldn't be surprised if a running back or two go to the portal. I think that would be the position group because you're looking at Davion Prim, um, Jalen Barberim. You have those two guys. You have the two high school guys coming in. You have Mangum is still around. You got Berger and Nate Carter. That's too many running backs. So this spring is tryouts. And I think no one has told me this. I'm just guessing at some point a couple of running backs will be told, you know what, we don't really see you. You know, you probably have a better chance to play somewhere else. So that's what I think is going to happen there. Good question. I think running back is the answer. And I think Prim and Barberin are guys, you, you know, unless they really do a lot of good things this spring, um, I could see them finding a tight situation. Uh, Sappy Johnson says this team needs to want to win more heart. Mr. Bowman says I disagree, Paul. I remember when non-point guards were forced because our point guard was hurt. Chris Hill was forced to learn. Alan Anderson was forced into duty. Uh, I agree. You're exactly right. That did happen. But I don't remember what the Paul what the exact point is that Paul was making that you're disagreeing with. But well noted. Uh, Whitey Spartan says, despite Paul playing well at times, he just doesn't seem to care. I don't agree with that. I think he's he's got a certain mental disposition, an intelligent young man, again, uh, someone for whom I have a lot of respect, not going to be the most fiery individual, someone who can be very hard on himself, but I do think that he he does care. But be careful with uh, with what you with how you you take his mannerisms and so forth. J.J. McKay says they need to embrace the pressure, not just act like it isn't there. Y.D. Spartan says you can't help but think NIL is affecting this team. Interesting point, Y.T. Sparty. Interesting point. And that is that 
that's one of the reasons that it's like herding cats. And that's one of the things that Izzo is trying to figure out in terms of buttons. And it's a new frontier. And it's concerning. It's bothersome. It's for Izzo, if this season doesn't get turned around, it'll end up being a sad situation because Izzo, he, he doesn't mind that the players are getting NIL, but um, it's a new world in terms of, uh, you know, finding those motivational buttons. You're onto something there. Let's see... Looks like you guys are talking about leadership here, going back and forth. Looks like you had a good decision on the discussion. I'll just fast forward past it. <clears throat> um, Sparty Party says, Sissoko, Cooper, and Carr on the floor at the same time. Not too many shots are going to go down. Sissoko, Cooper, and Carr. Um, Sissoko and Cooper played together for two minutes in this game. That was from like the 15-minute mark of the first half to the 13-minute mark. Was Carr on the court at the same time? Probably so, if you remember it that way. But you're talking about two, two minutes. You're probably talking about three possessions. It's not why they lost this game. But thanks for watching and posting. JJ McKay says, not sure what is up with Walker. He has played 36, 38 minutes most games for a while now and was fine. For whatever reason, his shooting has dropped off. You know, you're right, he is playing a lot of minutes, but at what percentage is the question. And not sure what answer we're going to get on that. And that is a lot of minutes, but is it at, you know, less than his top gear quickness, both off the dribble for his own shot and away from the ball coming off screens and defense. Izzo said after practice yesterday, he wants Walker to get back to playing the defense that was um, Walker's calling card when he was at Northeastern and his, when he first came to Michigan State. And it wavered a little bit in this game here and there, but he also turned cranked up the defense here and there, so it kind of ebbs and flows a little bit. Does the groin have something to do with that? Great questions. All those things bring into question what the ceiling is for the entire team. All right, more question. All right, we're probably just going to move on. Um, Tim Carpenter with a, with a comment from what I said, you, when I said you don't want to lose with Booker on the court, and he says, what, question mark, we want to lose with Sissoko on the court. Uh, good question, good point. And I thought I addressed it then, but I, I knew that that was going to spark some questions. My point is, if he, if it's like Heathcote used to say, nut cutting time, seven minutes to go, and you got to make a decision, you're going to go with the guy who started 40 games, 50 games, that's been in the Sweet 16, the second round, who's been, you know, to the, to the, um, who you can trust to be in the right place at the right time defensively, so that you're not getting beat down there, so that your guards can do more to win games on the other side. <clears throat> Someone who's going to be setting the screen in the right place. And I realize Booker's screening is getting better too. But if you play Booker there and he makes a mistake and you lose a game and he's on the court, and I realize unknown is undefeated, maybe Booker makes a three-pointer and you win the game. But this might sound foreign to a fan, but coaches think that way. They're like, I'm not going to get beat with that guy. If we're going to get beat, I'm going with my horses. That's what, I, that's what it means. And you might say, well, Sissoko's not a horse. Sissoko played well in the last seven minutes. I thought it was the, the best he's played his role since before his grandmother died prior to the Minnesota game. Booker played well, productive with some shot blocks, rebounds, scored a couple field goals, but you can't quite, you're not quite there yet to trust him with all of it just yet. Maybe he would have been fine. We don't know. Unknown's undefeated. Maybe he would have been fine. But the way coaches think, and I, I'm going to say most coaches would do this. Losing momentum, six-point game, seven minutes to go. I'm going with the guys that I that know the situation better, that I can trust a little better. And you know what? 
as much as the teammates are loving Booker and supporting him, I don't want to put words in people's mouths, Tim Carpenter. But with seven minutes to go, if you were to ask Tyson Walker and Hogard, who do you want on the court, Sissoko or Booker? <clears throat> they're not going to say it publicly, but I guarantee you they're going to say Sissoko. That's just another way of saying, so you can you can pin me down on you don't want to lose with Sissoko. That might not make sense to you. And after I just explained it, it still might not make, make sense. But if it doesn't make sense after this, you're probably not going to get it anyway. But thanks for posting. Um, looks like more discussions. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. I appreciate everybody that uh, has been watching. And we got some football conversation here also, but we have to wrap it up. Uh, I really could sit here and talk with you guys all day, but we're going to move on. We don't want to have a four-hour situation here. But appreciate all the interest and the support and the likes and everything else. Some good questions. Somebody asked, Danny Claypool asks, is Sissoko coming back next year? I don't know. Um, I don't think, you know, th those things are going to be exit poll at the end of the season type of things. And I'm, he could. I kind of assume he is. But anything can happen. So I'm not sure. All right. So we're going to wrap it up. Appreciate everybody tuning in on a Thursday afternoon. Hope everybody has a great weekend. Huge hockey weekend. Michigan State at Wisconsin. Michigan State. If they win on Friday, they will clinch their first conference championship since, what, the early 2000s, I think, when Ryan Miller was here. Unfortunately, we didn't get into hockey here. That's a disservice. That's a disservice on my behalf. I apologize. It is a big weekend. Check out SpartanMag.com for continued analysis and observation. And we are your... We are your... What's the word? Yeah, we're correspondents, but um, there's another word, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, I'll figure out what the word is later. I'm a little tired already. But I appreciate all the support. SpireMag.com subscribers, we appreciate um, your support and being here and watching on a Thursday afternoon. We'll see you next time. Have a great weekend. We'll be breaking it down early next week, planning earlier next week to do this. And we hope that you guys as fans are happier coming out of the weekend. But it's a big weekend. Everybody take care and be good.